here I am. Another episode of what you guys dub like Nobody Gares. <laughs> Ridiculous. Uh, I like that. Yeah. I have with me Bryce Bloom, who I've known for, I don't know, about a decade now, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, you are the OG esports lawyer. You wrote all the esports contracts back in the day. And there goes the monetization on this video, like right off the bat. But uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to let you intro yourself. And I, I'm actually curious because I've never asked you this. Why did you come to esports? Like, because lawyering is pretty is a pretty good job and there was no money here when you first came no there definitely wasn't i mean it was kind of it was it was organic i i often reflect that i fell with it i fell into it and then i ran with it so okay how did i get into esports i i was a law student that fell in love with league of legends and um, in particular because of the way in which law hiring works you get a job you apply for jobs for your second summer during your first summer at law firms so by the time I'm going into my second year of law school, so I'm only one third in with law school, I knew where I was going to be working the following summer, and I knew that as long as I didn't completely f*** it up, <laughs> I was going to then get an offer from them to work for them when I graduated. So that means I'm one third in with law school, and I essentially have secured my employment upon graduation. This matters because they don't actually care at all what happens in the second and third year of law school. They're going to evaluate oh. your work product your second summer and decide whether or not they like you based on your work product. So I, I phoned in second and third year of law school quite a bit. I played a lot of League of Legends for my <laughs> second and third year of law school because just my grades didn't matter anymore. It was yeah. relevant. My, my, the place where I went to start my career, they didn't even ask for my transcript. They didn't even get proof that I graduated, right? Holy I had shit. to like certify when I, when I registered for the bar that I graduated from an accredited law school, but uh, they, they really couldn't have cared less. So that's relevant because when I start my law career in the summer of 2013 i am deep 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 into league of legends at that point in time and they when you start at a law firm there's a whole bunch of shit jobs that no one wants to do one of which is writing for the law firm blogs every law firm has blogs no one reads them because they're a law firm's blog so why <laughs> would anyone bother reading this right and it's non-billable time, which is relevant because as a lawyer at a, at a law firm like that, I was working at a large corporate law firm. It's like the third biggest firm in the city of Seattle. Your only hours that matter are billable hours. Any non-billable time, you might as well be like on a beach somewhere sipping on a margarita, right? Like they, they actually don't care, which means that this, this act of populating the blogs, of writing stuff for the blogs is not something any lawyer wants to do. It's totally wasted time. So they make the baby lawyers do it. So Ooh. they made me do it. And I said, hey, if you're going to make me do it, I'm at least going to write about something that's interesting to me. And so what I did is I wrote about, I wrote an e-alert that was like 500 words that became an article that was like 1,500 words that then became a white paper that was around 3,000 words that then became a series of white papers that was around, I don't know, 10,000 words more. Uh, yeah about esports and the law and i was just like hey if you're gonna make me write for this th that this thing that no one's gonna read i'm at least gonna write about something that's interesting to me i'm a diehard gamer my whole life i was a burgeoning esports fan i had followed competitive starcraft and counter-strike when i was younger but not seriously in the way that i started to get into it with league of legends i'm a diehard sports fan for my whole life so sports fandom and the notion of esports kind of came naturally to me and i just immediately fell in love with it so I started to think about it. Okay, I'm also a lawyer. What's going on here from a legal perspective? It was all interesting to me. So I wrote about it. I, I published that white, that first white paper on the Legal Legends subreddit. Actually, just if we're going to be fully candid about it, Sean, I published it like three times, I think, right? So I fully, I fully <laughs> violated Reddit rules. But I was convinced that it was really different content than what would typically go on our League of Legends, as you can imagine. Um, did it go viral at all? Like, did, did it, it pick did. up wrong? So the first two times it got no traction at all, but I had spent a lot of time on that subreddit. I was convinced people would find it interesting, and I experimented around with kind of when I posted it. And the third time I posted it was the number one post on the subreddit that day. I had a couple of streamers, some team CEOs get in touch with me to have conversations oh. about League of Legends and esports more generally in the law some people who wanted concrete help with things like player contracts. I've been practicing law for all of a month or two at this point in time, maybe three months. I don't remember exactly when it went live. So I wasn't qualified to do anyone's legal work, esports or otherwise, but I was fortunate that I had all these senior lawyers at the firm who could then backstop me and basically taught me how to be a lawyer. And I slowly but surely pivoted my direction from being a general commercial litigator. So lawsuits, right? Like kind of what people think about when they think about lawyers going to court and suing other people into a transactional focus. So very kind of contract forward, 
focused on entertainment and esports. So mm. I cut my teeth doing like film contracts. You know, I did a, I did actor agreements for like Jennifer Roberts and Julia or Jennifer Anderson Whoa. and Julia Roberts and Jason Sudeikis and stuff like that on on big movies. I started doing some sports work. We were lucky that the firm did all of Paul Allen's work, which was mostly real estate, but he also happened to own the Trailblazers and the Seahawks. So I got to do some sports related work and just Ooh. kind of built out this knowledge while I was kind of cutting my teeth on esports stuff and the rest of it kind of snowballed naturally. So to give context about myself, like I was, I don't, I don't consider myself, like if someone were to ask me if I was a professional player, like before Cloud9, I would say no, but I was still on like the best, like North American team. It's just, yep. there was no money. Like yeah. there was no money. I was still in school. Like I was yep. still getting my, like my master's at the time. I, I didn't, I ended up dropping out of my master's program, but um, before you came into esports, there was a lot of contracts that were <laughs> laughable. So who you did, a, you you were with a lot of orgs, a lot. Like I remember the Bryce Bloom contract like back <laughs> in the day. And it was like a copy paste from all of yep. the orgs I talked to. What was like the first one that kind of introed you in and got you on the in? And how did that happen? So when I started my practice, it was it was primarily at League of Legends, both because that's where I had published the white paper, so it's where people came to knew me first, and also because I there was more business happening there, right? It was around the time that the LCS was getting stood up. You had a the you know professional class of players, Riot guaranteeing minimum salary to everybody. So I was working with whoever wanted me. It started with players. I started working with like Voy Boy, who was a big a big player mm -hmm. at the time. I started working with Steven Snoopy Ellis, who was a big player at the time. Yeah. That was my initial exposure to player contracts. And it, I wasn't drafting them at the time, right? I was getting whatever the org provided for them. These contracts were terrible in a lot of ways. And, and one of the truly eye-opening experiences that I had early on is I came in with the bin that I think a lot of fans had, which is you know, players, orgs exploit players, right? Like just like a really simple thesis that I think a lot of fans have felt throughout the course of esports history and many still think to this day. And one of my real eye-opening moments is when I did Voy Boy's contract, I told him, hey, there's a lot of things in this contract that I'm gonna be working on. Some of this stuff I don't think is gonna actually be objectionable. It's just these contracts were clearly not written by someone who knew anything about esports. And so let's let's work on it and then let's see if we can get the org to agree to have the other players contract match your contract from a legalese perspective obviously material terms salary is going to be different but the legalese can be the same he said joey said great that sounds awesome thank you so much i'll relay that he did we worked on his contract for a couple weeks when we got done i said okay cool let's i said to the team owner hey let's port this over for the other players and he goes oh we actually the other players actually already signed they signed the contract like as soon as i put it in front of them even though joey had told them to, to wait to sign their contract. They couldn't, they weren't paying for the legal services. They didn't need any of that support. They were just needed to wait and get a better deal. They couldn't even do that. Meanwhile, here was a team owner who was happily editing the contract in a bunch of ways that were in fact favorable to players in terms of what the changes were. Um, but he was happy to do it because he wanted his contract to better reflect the actual relationship. And that was phase one in doing the esports player contract was just creating something that actually made sense in the context of the player team relationship. It was so different than anything that had existed before and no one had ever really even attempted to do that. And we've just iterated on it ever since. Yeah, what what you said, I actually have a lot of experience in unironically. Um I'm sure you remember these time frames because I'm I guarantee you were involved. I just mm -hmm. don't know how, but like the whole PEA time frame yeah, from of CS yeah. from CSGO, right? Mm -hmm. Where the org owners came together and they wanted to form a league. They wanted to give the players like profit sharing, but they kind of like used a clause in the contract saying that they could basically dictate where the players played. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then I ended up getting let go from TSM Remember? and TSM tried to like put like a hush on me uh, and tried to come after me. And that's when I hired like legal help to, mm -hmm. to kind of like just protect myself at the time. And I hired to like probably one of like the best lawyers I've ever spoke to. Mm -hmm. Like he helped a lot with like major league baseball and I think like the NBA at the time, yeah. if I remember correctly, I think his name was Cliff Paulette. Polevsky, but I'm not 100% on that. Like, but this guy was incredible. Like, he was, he was such an amazing lawyer, but he knew nothing about yep. esports and how it operated. And when I showed him the contract, he was like so confused as to like how these things could be existing. And 
yeah, you, you almost like have to have presence within like the space in order to determine like what is fair play. Like, mm -hmm. so does that mean that, uh, so if a lawyer like that, like doesn't understand a legal contract and like why things are in it, is it actually, does it actually hold up? You mean like, is the contract enforceable? Yeah, because like yeah. from your perspective, it is. But from his perspective, it's like, how is this enforceable? But like, obviously it matters if you're in the field, right? So the enforceability of a contract isn't usually determined holistically. It would be determined on a clause by clause basis. Most contracts have what's called a severance clause in them. So that if a court ever says, hey, this non-compete is not something we agree, agree can happen in, in the state of California. You just take out that part of the contract and the rest of the contract becomes, you know, is still valid. So as a baseline, yeah, I'd say in general, esports player contracts are enforceable. There have definitely been instances where individual language that was used or the way in which it was used was would not be enforceable in a jurisdiction. It happens all the time, actually. Now, one of the interesting exercises that I went through in the arc of my career, because I was pretty junior as I was standing up my esports practice, right? So I'm at large law firm for a couple of years, then I leave and I'm, I co-found a boutique with my mentor from the previous large law firm. And then I founded my current firm ESG at the beginning of 2017, so around seven years ago. And uh, one of the interesting arcs was I started running into a lot of type of folks that you're talking about, right? People who came from a traditional sports background, who felt like the standard esports player contract was unconscionable. How can, how can, you know, NIMS likeness rights, this was a big one. How can it work yeah. this way, right? Like why are players giving all of these rights over to teams? That doesn't make any sense. It's not in how perpetuity. it's done in sports. Well, it's not usually in perpetuity, right? Yeah. At least not on, on my contract. No, not on yours, not on yours. Yeah, but, but yeah, yeah, these were, this is what was so interesting is there was this, this kind of like, there were these initial there was this initial phase where there were all sorts of terms that were just objectively terrible, right? Like per perpetual name image likeness rights for all forms of usage just to make no sense whatsoever. And that was that needed to be done away with. Uh, the notion of a player being able to be terminated without any form of notice or compensation. That was a thing that just should not have existed in some of the early days of esports. And one of the things I did was say hey like let's let's institute if you want to terminate someone without cause there's a notice period or there's a, a a flat amount you have to pay and in theory that amount should scale up based on the value of the contract the length of the contract etc right provide some stability in these contracts now i don't want to paint it like everything i was doing was something that was good for players another thing that i was heavily involved with was the elimination of buyouts in contracts right there was as i'm sure you remember from like really yeah. early days of esports player contracts every player felt like it was mission critical to have a number in their contract that yeah. if this number was paid they could get out right and that is a concept that was early day esports that was really harmful to the ability for organizations to kind of build a business to invest in talent to develop that talent because anyone could come along at any point in time and say well 50 grand says so in the contract and those numbers were always hard coded at the beginning of the contract which means that if a player experienced growth they were always going to be it was always going to be worth it to buy them out of that contract and so there was a shift towards allowing the free market to dictate those amounts now admittedly there are friction points on the other end of that as well. The notion of contract jail is born and people are upset about being held under contract. And there are definitely instances, we can get into this if you want to, where I think it's been used problematically. I will say that in general, I don't have a lot of sympathy for the notion of contract jail because if you sign a contract to play for a team for two years, you're agreeing to do that for two years. And just because this team is worse than you thought and you'd like to go play somewhere else with your buddies because you think you have a better chance of winning a title over here, that doesn't mean you're in prison. As long as the, as long as the team that, you, that you've signed to is honoring that contract, they're treating you fairly and well, they're doing, they're doing all the things they're supposed to be doing, including providing you with salary, you're not in jail. You just wish you could be on a different team that's more competitive, but talk to any athlete on planet Earth, and they're going to sympathize with that problem, but it doesn't mean the solution is that a player should be able to go play wherever they want, whenever they want. Yeah, I mean, in traditional sports, there have been like star players that are benched that are paid yeah. crazy amounts of money just to sit on the bench, right? Yep. Just due to like you know, mental issues, physical injuries, like whatever, like it, it could be anything. My last question about this is something I've always been curious about. Could you uphold an independent contractor contract in the state of California in esports? Oh, no, no, not in the state of I California so. in esports, but this is a recent change. So uh, a couple of years ago, roughly, there was a court decision that was then codified into law. The court decision was called Dynamex. It, ch it dramatically changed how 
I, this is going to be way too esoteric. Really fast. <laughs> employment classification versus versus uh, contractor classification is on a state by state basis. Every state has different rules. California always had rules that made it harder to classify people as contractors. It's gotten way harder. This is primarily in connection with things like Uber that was taking advantage of classifying everyone as contractors and workers were being dramatically compensated less than they than they should have been. They weren't receiving basic protections of workers' compensation. They weren't getting health benefits, etc. And the import of the changes has made it very challenging. If it, What it says is if the person's in your core line of work, you can't classify them as a contractor. So if you're an esports gotcha. team... Your core line of work is, you know, esports players and competing, and you can't you can't make a esports player in California than a contractor. They have to be an employee. So the the funny thing about this is, like, a plumber that's coming and working for an esports team can be classified as an independent contractor. A plumber that's working for a plumbing company cannot. So a plumbing company can no longer structure their company where it's a series of independent contractors, even if these people are all operating independently and working fewer hours and all this different stuff. It's really – it's honestly a wonky system that I think has raised as many issues as it has solved. But, yeah, uh, yeah you couldn't in California. Wasn't it, wasn't it also a problem because – isn't it true that you can't necessarily tell an independent contractor like what to use for their job? So like telling them that they have to use, say like, you know, HyperX mouse or like mm -hmm. HyperX headset, like that technically like skirts in like an illegal area. So how it typically works, right? And California is different, but the typical regime is that it's a totality of circumstances test and there's like dozens of variables that you look at. So uh. what equipment they're using, how much supervision they're under, whether or not they're setting their own schedule, whether or not they're directed to do things or to not do things, like all of this type of stuff. And there's, I could literally like pull up a list, Sean, and there's 20 <laughs> variables and we could talk through each one, right? The, what I would tell clients, because there was a huge phase where classification was such a big deal in the esports space. And there were a lot of clients that were misclassifying intentionally. There were some that were misclassifying or that were like taking, you know, making risky decisions. There were some that were completely buttoned up and it's evolved over the course of my, you know, 11 year career in esports. But what I would typically tell people is like, look, if it's someone like Sean, he's playing on your team and you have a, you're setting your you're setting the scrim schedule and there's they have to use all of your equipment and they're competing at your office or at your gaming house and there's a coach that's, you know, overseeing all this on stuff. You're going to have a really hard time selling any judge that this is uh this is a person that should be classified as a contractor. But if it's you know, Mango, for example, right? Just think Cloud9, right? Uh, or, you know, Leffen, yeah. if we want to use TSM or whatever, right? And it's someone who's using their own equipment, schedule, you know, picking their own schedule, training on their own. There's no coaching oversight. They're living independently. And really the, the arrangement is, hey, when you go show up to a tournament, you're going you're gonna to wear our jersey and you're going to promote our sponsors. And when you stream, you're going to have a Cloud9 overlay or TSM overlay or whatever, and you're going to promote our team and our sponsors. And that's it. That's the sum total of the connection. You actually do have a fairly compelling argument that that is exactly what class contractor classification is all about. It's someone really mm. operating independently who has some kind of loose affiliation with the company. Interesting. Okay. So that, that's, that sheds a lot of light on that because I always wondered that. Um, that was something that was very interesting with me like to me about like the independent contractor thing. And then totally. shortly after like the whole PA thing, everyone moved to like employment contracts, mm -hmm. which I thought was pretty, pretty cool. Like, uh, yeah. And it was, it was that, a necessary transition Did yeah. you, really fast. The only point I didn't make is that contractors are cheaper. That's yes. why, that's why it all started that way. It's because org, orgs way back when could not afford to set up the infrastructure and pay the extra money that was required and, and not to mention complying with things like minimum wage and overtime requirements, right? There's, all sorts of additional burdens that fall on a company that's trying to pe treat people as employers. And so co they contractors was a kind of necessary beginning for esports teams in a lot of ways. Certain teams held on to that much longer than they should have. Other teams made that transition a lot faster. But you're right. Eventually, we transitioned to most esports players being paid and treated as employees. And I think that's a net good for the industry. Yeah, I, I, no, I agree. I think it's so good that like we moved in this direction. And I think in large part, it's due to like the money influx within esports, mm -hmm. like following after that. Yep. So I'm going to like fast forward now, right? Uh, after all the VC money has come in, after, you know, League of Legends has blown up, CSGO has had like its wave of crazy tournaments. And here we are today after the pandemic, where I think during the pandemic, esports had this massive boom, right? Everyone was stuck inside. 
the numbers were so inflated in those mm -hmm. early months. It caused even Valorant to be released early. Like the developers knew they, they struck a gold mine on timing. So they yep. just released the game early. With all of that in mind, we are now in a time where all of those benefits have receded away and we are in what is now being dubbed, I guess, in your article as the esports winter. So you wrote this amazing article. It's, I, I don't even know like how many words this is it 30,000, I think is what you said. All, all told, but that includes, you know, Jake has a piece, which is awesome. Ovi has two pieces yeah. that are long winded and great. We co authored some stuff. So it's the total project. Yeah. So in this piece, you talk a lot about like, how we got here like what it's like right now you know like what esports you know like the fan is like the fandom within the industry you talk about the models of teams which you know a lot about i don't know how have you worked a lot with the developers or is it just like teams players so i've done consulting work for developers and on the law firm side we have worked with developers the, ch the challenging thing has been that because our core book of business eventually we kind of staked out as the team side of the business right and we rep basically all the biggest western esports teams so that creates a pretty clear conflict of interest with any publisher that has built a meaningful esports ecosystem that involves them so we could never do work for a riot or a blizzard Ooh. activision or a valve um, so I've done work for people like Pokemon that have not at the publisher level that have not gotten into the stage where they're interested in, in engaging big esports teams or really even having like the marquee players. It's much more kind of grassroots. It's about engagement and volume of players. The organized play at Pokemon is fascinating. And that's just true of a lot of publishers. And part of what Ovi really gets into his article is not every, I can't remember exactly what he calls it. I think he says calls it an outlier esport, right? Not every esport is going to be even remotely capable of getting to the level of you know, independent monetization, self-sustaining in the way that like Counter-Strike has or League of Legends has or, you know, Dota has or so on and so forth, right? Some of them get there for a little bit, right? Like Overwatch had a moment for a few years where, say what you want about the Overwatch League and we can get into that if you want to, but there was certainly a few years where the game was big enough to, to be that and sure. the game has, you know, waned in popularity. Um, and that's true for most esports. Most esports don't stay there for that long, right? They have yeah. a, a flash in the pan, maybe it's, you know, a few months, couple years whatever and that's part of the problem that you guys like outline in this essay do you want to give like a like a high level kind of i think everyone <laughs> everyone should read it because there's no way we can cover everything in here like this is an incredible read if you have interest in the economics of the industry and why we're facing the problems we have now and why this isn't just a simple fix it's not going to be done within a couple months i think this is going to be a painful Couple, from my perspective, yes, uh, I think this is going to be a painful couple years. I don't mm -hmm. think it's going to be done in even a year. Yes, 100% um, yes. So what, I guess, like, how would you summarize your article if you could? It's all, I really appreciate the kind words. It's, it's actually an impossible task. I think yeah. the journey of writing this really convinced me it's an impossible task. We didn't want to write 30,000 words. We knew, we knew in writing 30,000 words that we were dramatically <laughs> shrinking the audience for this thing, right? We knew we were gonna spend all this time writing something and very few people were actually gonna sit down and fucking read it because who wants to sit down and read 30,000 words? No one reads essays anymore. This isn't like uh -huh. a, this isn't exactly the medium you choose, right? Um, but we don't have a, we didn't have a platform to have a podcast discussion uh, of our own and, and even if we had, we felt like sometimes putting it on paper is really valuable for people. So one, thank you for the opportunity to come on and discuss it. I really, I really appreciate yeah. it. Bryce, um, this is the problem with esports man you're not in touch with your demographic man like where, <laughs> you need this in like tiktok form it needs tiktok form right it's gonna be fifteen thousand tiktoks and you just get them one minute at a time um look the 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 attempt was to encapsulate all the different causes of the esports winter i started out trying to do it in a single essay that became impossible it became a group project that's why Ovi got involved that's why jake got involved there were some other folks that we talked about as well it's it's too long to summarize but the high high level is this period was inevitable. It is going to take a little while to course correct for sure. We're talking years, not months. Um, I, I personally believe strongly that the sports industry will come out better for it when the dust settles. I think we're a lot of the things that we did over the course of the last decade were experimentation. We're spending a lot of other people's money because it became such a hot investment sector. And that we learned a lot and we grew a lot and there's still a lot of opportunity moving forward but we we have to change some of our core decision making over the course of the last year uh we have to walk back some things that we've done 
for example, some of our financial modeling, some of the ways in which we're tack tackling revenue growth are fundamentally flawed, as is, as is our spending, quite frankly, right? Like we dramatically accelerated in a bunch of areas on the spending side, including player salaries. Player yes. salaries are completely out of control in a lot of esports. Infrastructure, the you know teams and league infrastructure, and everything became very bloated. There were a lot of people working a lot of different things. It's look if you if you want to optimize performance, yes, you do need a head coach and multiple assistant coaches and analysts and sports psychologists and personal trainers and all these things. These do optimize performance, but there's a reason why it took sports decades to get there. It's really expensive and it's hard to justify some of those types of investments in light of current capability of monetization. Um, and we also need to just unlock new revenue buckets and think differently about a lot of these businesses because a lot of our one-to-one -one mimicking of traditional sports for the last decade has proven to be unsuccessful. It's successful in some ways, but if you can't replicate the entire picture, you need to find a way to make up for that delta somehow. And I think that's a lot of the work left ahead of us. So look, there's a bunch of causes we get into. You know, Ovi talks heavily about the about the incentive structures. And I think that's really critical. I talk about everything ranging from the, you know, sports, the monetization models and kind of thinking more critically about fandom. I get into the expectation setting games that have happened. I don't think any of this is fatal to the industry, right? The, the My big picture takeaway, I, I say it multiple times, is this is a market correction, not an extinction event. I think it's important yes. that we're realistic about that. And I don't say that to diminish the pain that we're going through. A lot of people are losing their jobs. It's going to be really challenging a couple of years, probably a lot longer because it'll take a while to ramp back up. But I think ultimately we're going to get to a better place. I, I couldn't agree more. I think... Now it's it's super complex. It is a very complex thing. I think it's blatantly obvious that esports is here to stay, right? We have our first generation of people that came through. You look at the number growth in viewership, it is insane. Like just the yep. growth in that there's been tests into like all kinds of stuff, whether it be like co-streaming or like multi-streaming in different languages and reaching new audiences. Uh, I, we could start at the trunk of the tree, which I would consider like the key stakeholders in this industry, mm -hmm. probably like the developers and the platforms. Yep. yep. Uh, or you could go to the branches, which would be like what? Like in some cases, I guess the TOs, but in some instances, mm -hmm. the TOs are the devs. Yep. I guess you could call like the branches the orgs, and then the leaves would be the players. Yep. And maybe like the flowers that bud from the, those things are like the fans, right? Like, just yep. all over the place. So where would you like to start here? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like let's, I, I like this. I've never used this mental model of the tree, but I really like it. Let's, I, I think it makes a ton of sense. I think any conversation around this kind of has to start with the publishers. And I think, yeah. the, I would say the publishers are the plat, or the publishers are the trunk. I don't think you, yeah. if you, if by platforms, you mean like the Twitches and YouTubes, yes. I think they're, I would put them in the branch category. Now they're, you know, esports focus is small in comparison to their bigger thing. So it's kind of silly talking about a company like Twitch or YouTube as a branch. But in this context, I think they probably are. Yeah, especially because the platforms like Twitch, they used to be heavily invested in esports. They used to aid in the growth of esports. But as time went on and, you know, like Amazon acquired Twitch, they had to grow and they had to grow quick. And so they started to reach out to like new markets like the NFL or you know, like chats, just chatting. Like these are areas like the IRL streams where they would give people backpacks. You know, like they're they're trying to expand their audience because they realize they probably like plateaued in some sense with esports. So with that in mind, so like so we're starting with the devs. There is a lot of approaches here. Like there's Riot, who I mean, for lack of a better way to explain it, like can kind of I'll just say like control freaks, right? Like they are a developer that are also the tournament organizer that runs the broadcasts, you know, like, and controls the entire circuit. They, they rule their IP with like an iron fist. And then you have Valve on the other hand, who might not even be a game developer in, in many people's eyes, like yeah. at the top of this, they're just a marketplace for games yeah. and they happen to also have been a developer and now they just do this like on the side you know like yep. they have like 300 total employees you like you can't even compare those two but yet they have titles that are directly competing against each other mm -hmm. 
and are very close, like League of Legends and Dota 2 and Counter-Strike and Valorant. These are like competing titles. And some would argue that like the Valve titles are better off for it. The open circuits, the open API, letting the community do everything for you, right? Like everything. Um, and then there's someone like Nintendo, which doesn't want anything to do with esports. And I totally understand that perspective as well, because Nintendo had that first mover advantage where they were the first like true gaming console in the world. It's like the gateway drug into gaming. Every kid when we were kids, I don't know if they still do, actually, I have no idea, buys gaming consoles. And we're, about to, we're about to find out, Sean. We're, we're going to enter the our kids game phase of life and it's going to be awesome. We're going to learn real quick. Uh, but they operated on a totally different model where like, you know, kids are introduced to these consoles and they didn't need to market via esports. They also don't have microtransactions within the game. So what the what would they be spending for? Why do they care if there's an esport? There's no reason for them to promote it. So like who is doing it right right now in your eyes? But and where do you think we're gonna end up? Do you think Riot's way of being like the TO and the dev is the right way? Cause I would argue that whoever said John Riot, who's sitting at the top, they have to be looking at Valve and they have to be wondering like, should we just like let them run shit for us and get this free marketing? Like, why do we have offices in Berlin, Santa Monica, in Korea, all these places? I look at Valve, I mean, they own Steam. They have one office in Bellevue where they have like three floors on a building, 300 yeah. employees, 12 people working on CS2. Like, and they're just raking in money. Yeah. Like they're and that just... office that office is sick, by the way. They it's insane. Bowl, they have bowling alleys, they have full time masseuses. Yes. Like they have, a gym. They have like they have a, their gym is insane. It's yeah. like the it's like one of the nicest gyms you'll ever see. And they have personal trainers that are yes. employees of yeah. Valve. So you can I think it's like you get two sessions a week you can sign up for. And then they're also just, you know, if there's a free block and you go down and you want to work with a personal trainer. So like you could theoretically work out with a personal trainer at Valve every day for yes. free. No. Pretty sick. No, the way Valve treats their employees is, it's the best I've ever seen. It's, it's like, I feel like once you work for Valve, you should never leave. Like, yeah, I, I, and, and very few people do, <laughs> Yeah, by the way. Like uh, those yeah. benefits you mentioned, they don't even go to just the employees. They go to the partners of the employees too. Like if you're a spouse yeah. of the employees, you get access to all this shit too. And that's how well they treat, you know, their employees. I. It's so interesting because I was in the Riot offices one week and then I was in the Valve offices the next week. So I could just directly compare yep. the two. And man, just like, I just feel like the way Valve treats like their company and everything and just, it's so different. It is so it, different. At a philosophical level, it's hard to be wired more differently than these two companies are. Now to be clear, Riot treats its employees from a perks perspective, right? It's re sure, it's really, really well, nice too. The food is provided. Food is provided yes. at Valve and is insane. Food is provided in Riot is insane. There's tons of gaming setups and there's tons of cool shit to do at Riot. Riot's in the upper upper yes. echelon in terms of Absolutely. these types of perks as well. Uh, but to return to the core question of like, what is the right way to do it? I feel really strong that there is no one right way to do it. I think different people are going to look at these situations very differently, and we're going to have a lot more instances of this where new publisher emerges and creates a you know, a 10,000 hour game that uh, is incredibly popular and competitive and has esports potential and reasonable minds can disagree about the right way to approach it. I will say that I think that Riot, I don't think Riot ever looks at Valve and says we should be that because I think that philosophically they're just completely different companies, right? Yeah. And Riot's already invested so much in so building out much. the capability and the infrastructure, right? The studios and the understanding they've had so much growing pains because they had to learn how to do all of this stuff themselves and it's not core to the business of a game publisher right a game publisher a game developer makes and publishes games and they monetize those games running operating events for that figuring out a broadcast for it competitive infrastructure organization collaboration monetization these are things that are way outside the wheelhouse of, of a typical game game publisher or developer so Riot, I think, is going to be Riot until the end of time. It's really hard for me to envision them them stepping away from what they've done. And it's very kind of Disney-like. They're thinking about this 360-degree approach to their IP that starts with the games. And it evolves into a lot of things. Esports is one core pillar, right? Competitive is a core pillar of the use of League of, Le of, of Riot IP, not just League of Legends IP anymore, right? Like their IP is a lot broader now. Nice. Um, and... 
they are doing things like arcane and there have been conversations around movies and if you look at the use like the way the way they do their league of legends world song every year where they do like a collaborative like an original music video with a collaboration with the major artist they're they're thinking about the flywheel of their ip much more similar to someone like disney that's like hey we're cartoons and movies and theme parks and collectibles and all these different things and so i think that game publishers are going to start to understand that there's a lot more opportunity with their ip and this is it's not just riot blizzard has done this to a certain extent world of warcraft movie and blizzcon and there's all sorts of investment into this and we're i think really just starting to scratch the surface i think when we when we look ahead 50 to 100 years the biggest game publishers are going to be are going to be ip rights holders akin to the disney's of the world i think that's a lot of their mission now there's going to be a lot of people who are going to get into the situation and say that's not doesn't make a lot of sense this isn't worth it even if even if you want to be disney even if you want to think of your ip flywheel as a lot broader than just creation of video games that doesn't mean you have to operate you don't have to like learn how to run events and create your own broadcast no. studio and learn how to do the stream and sell the sponsorships and or, you know organize the competition for you don't have to when riot made the decision to do that they looked around in the early 2010s and they saw they were like esl we're, our vision of what we're trying to do is like much bigger when, than what these people were doing right like they wanted to solve mm-hmm. the staples center they wanted to win sports semis they wanted to create something that was unique to esports and they said they said esl mlg these people maybe they were wrong in their evaluation i don't know i think there are people at esl people in mlg who said if you gave us that money we could have done it as well or better reason why i could disagree about that but they looked around and said I don't think the people out there in the market are going to be able to do this. They didn't have the WWEs, the NBAs of the world banging down their door to do it because esports were not on the mainstream consciousness in the way that they are today. And so they chose to do it themselves. One theory that I have posited a little bit in the essays is that I think that we'll look back on this arc as like the publisher era of esports. And while I don't think that Riot will go go back right on this set of decision making, I think a lot of others will. I think Blizzard Activision basically winning carbon copy what riot was doing with the franchising and the infrastructure and i think that there's a lot of regret there and i think that they're going to reevaluate and go back towards more of a middle position where they support their esports they have people in their in-house who work on them but maybe don't go to quite the same like own and operate fully and then you're gonna have people on valve and the spectrum and everyone in between i think riot will be the outlier when we look back on the arc of esports history not the model that everyone copied even though a lot of people did attempt to copy in the wake of some of riot success I I couldn't agree more. Like, I think what Riot has done is incredible. Like, as someone that came from a Valve game, I was a CSGO pro, just witnessing what this company does and how many people they employ and, like, meeting all of the people that work in, like, these, like, little micro areas of their games and, like, they're so aware. They are so aware of every single thing i mean some would argue that they're they're like bloated they're too bloated Mm -hmm. because of how big they got but when people ask me like you know like is valorant or csgo going to be the future because play them both or cs2 i guess at this point uh the answer is just like they're both going to coexist but it's because cs2 has the simplicity it's like it's the simplest, purest esport there is. This yep. I could teach my parents it. I could teach my grandma how to play like CS2, you know, or not play it, but like understand what's happening on the screen. Mm-hmm. Valorant is a little trickier, yep. but they have Riot, and I will always believe that Riot will produce a game that a shit ton of people play. Mm-hmm. You look, at, I don't know what they do for like uh, like social platform stuff, but. My God, like it's the quick the one of the first things I noticed playing Valorant was like this shit is all over Twitter, it's all over Instagram, it's all over TikTok, it's all over mm-hmm. everywhere. We might it might it might have the same player base as CS2, but they must be doing something to like get interactions on these social platforms up because and I believe they do because I believe Riot is smart enough to do stuff like that. Of course. Um the and they're co- invested. They're invested yeah. in doing stuff like that. They want like if you you frame this initial question with 
well, you've got like Riot over here, and you got Valve, and you got Nintendo that's completely mm. disengaged. Nintendo is not just disengaged. Nintendo is like actively hostile to the yes. esports, right? Ask if you ask the average like Smash Bros fan what they think of Nintendo in relation to esports, they're gonna be like, I wish they would just leave us the fuck alone. Like, I wish they just let us do our thing instead of like cease and desisting this event or this technology or this whatever, right? Um, they're like actively against the notion of the growth of their esports, which is why people are so excited about Project L. Because people yeah. are like, listen, if someone, if Riot creates a great fighting game, then we're going to have something we've never experienced in the fighting game esports community before, which is a publisher that is going to be invested in the growth and development of the scene in a way that they've never experienced. You know, TFT, new genre of game, Riot's just starting to really get in and experiment with that. And it's so, you know, I'm heavy into the TFC scene. And it's really exciting. And I'm so happy that it's with Riot. There are trade offs. Right, so there are major riot haters out there who could be on this podcast and make very reasonable <laughs> points as it relates to some of the downsides of that, and we can talk about that as well if you want. But but there are very clear positives as well. And if you told me, hey, new esport comes out that you're gonna, you and I are gonna be huge players of, fans of, which publisher would we want to be the one behind it? I would pick Riot. I don't know about you. I would probably pick Riot. Yeah, yeah. I think like see. I think the way Valve operates their game is awesome. The way that they have an open API and then allow their community to literally create and do everything, that is insane. Like the communities that were created inside of Counter-Strike, people don't talk about that. So you open up Counter or you open up Steam right now. I actually did this exercise yesterday. You go to store, you go to stats, and you can check the the current players on all the games within steam this is something you can't do in a yep. in like riot games right like every now and then they'll let you know how many people are playing their games but they're privy to all that info and it's a black box you don't know yep. but cs2 so right now concurrently there's over a million people playing the game and second it is the first on all of steam second is dota 2 at like 550k right now yeah um i know as a someone that came from cs that this is like I feel like right now we're on like a launch pad for CS because I know that the communities in Counter-Strike that are created by the community themselves have yet to be formed in CS2, like Surf Mod, Death Run, you know, Warcraft 3 Mod, like you name all of these things that people that are around in this industry know about and have played Hide and Seek Mod. Like I can just keep headshot only Deathmatch servers, Deathmatch yep. servers created by the community, like Tarek used to have his own Deathmatch servers. Like there's so many things that the community can do outside of just playing the game that the developers have made. I mean, Counter-Strike itself was a mod that was purchased by Valve. So um, it's it's so wild to see that difference. But I do think that like Riot's full control method, while it spends so much money, it might be the optimal solution from like a developer point of view. And I love what they do as far as like, like you said, like Arcane, and they have tapped into all of the, the big esports areas, like the card game, the fighting game, you know, the Counter Strike competitor in FPS, League of Legends. They, you just keep going, MMO like MMO on the horizon. MMO on the horizon. They're working on like a probably like a Valorant movie, I think, right now. Like they're just constantly working. And then the cherry on top of all this, or maybe actually the the Sunday itself, uh, is the streaming platform. Did you hear about that? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much we can get into it, but yeah, I think uh, the the notion of a publisher owning distribution makes a lot of sense for the same reason why the streaming wars have existed in the first place, right? And if you can create, a, if, if there's going to be enough games that people want to stream and it's all your IP, you can, they can they can immediately change from a legal perspective so that you cannot stream their games anywhere else but on their platform. They could just do that overnight. Uh, now, there's a lot of reasons why they might not want to do that overnight and yeah. community backlash and creator backlash and all the different stuff. But there's a lot of incentives for them to, again, if we're going to own the flywheel, a distribution platform could certainly be part of that. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, John Needham did mention in an interview that the streaming platform is going to have like obviously access to your Riot Games account, right? Mm -hmm. So it will know your microtransactions within the game, what you like to spend on, what you like to do in the game. Do you like to pick this agent or that agent? And hypothetically speaking, you know, like you could be watching an esports tournament and you see, you know, Doublelift, 
double with playing Valorant, and he gets like a, a 3 k with like this Vandal skin. You know, like a pop up could happen on your streaming platform within a second, asking if you want to purchase that within the game, and that is an incredible power because now you have true information on esports giving a sale. Yes. And I don't know. See, the, the problem with all of this is like, who says Riot shares that? Like, they don't have to share shit. Like, that, that's the problem here, right? Is like, do we, do you trust the developers to do the right thing with this power that they are creating? If they have this streaming platform, they could literally make the esports industry profitable pretty quickly. Like, that could be the turnaround that the industry needs, in my opinion, is something like that. Because now all of a sudden, you know, like, you get all of the teams, you get all of the big creators that want to co-stream, they're all doing it on this platform, right? They're all doing it on this platform. Riot is like probably bootstrapping it initially, obviously in some kind of way, because the initial phase of getting the buy-in is the hardest part. We've seen yeah, it time sure. and time again with these platforms. They all fall apart, Azubu, you, you name it. Like Kick is, Kick is the current one, but there's been, there's been so many like over these years mm -hmm. that have tried to compete against Twitch and have failed. Um, do you think that that's actually like a viable way that we get out of this shithole? Well, so I think one of the things that Ovi gets into really deeply in his essay relates to attribution of monetization and the importance of direct esports monetization. That if you're just saying, hey, create more in game goods that overlap with esports and then revenue share them, like that can be a piece of the puzzle, but attribution is really challenging. There's all sorts of interesting incentives around this. It's hard to prove out opportunity cost of, okay, you created this esports skin and it sold X and you would just share Y percent of that. What would have happened if instead of spending your your art resources on creating this esports skin, you had created something that had nothing to do with esports and you wouldn't have to share it. So now the X that you generate, you just keep 100% of it. And how can you prove out how much it would have sold in relation and how much if you, okay, well, maybe we just add artists and you do both. Well, what about cannibalization? How much, how much do people actually have to spend? You know, there's no way that it's just a growing pie. And the more you create, the more you make, like there is such a thing as saturation. So all this stuff is really challenging. One of the great things as you're pointing out about the this type of distribution platform is you could have attribution. You could have it to individuals. You could yeah. have it be so that you could theoretically track all of it. You know, how there was a special offer that came up during this game, and we sold, you know, how many people bought during this game. There was a special offer that came up during your co stream or Tarek's co stream. How, you know, how many people bought on, from that, like clicked on that link, right? And you know that it was this person activating their fan to do it. That's really great, and that's part of the puzzle. There's a much broader puzzle that I think needs to be solved, right? But I think the notion of being able to more directly tie esports fan spend to that fandom and then some version of revenue sharing sounds re really fair and smart to me if we can actually pull it off it, it would be insane if they could pull it off and if they do the right things to share that mm -hmm. now i don't they don't have to that's the thing like they don't, they, they don't have to like mm -hmm. no one can make them do it but they could do it and that just like the sheer option of that being available is very exciting to me actually like because i do think that that would be like a very very insane thing for like the esports industry now i would argue like yeah like what i said earlier just that is kind of insane they're running like all the esports they have the streaming platform they're the to they run the calendar i mean why what's stopping them from just being the, t the team why can't they just be the team well, the, the reason why they can't be the team is because well, there's a bunch of reasons, right? So they, they, they don't want to be the team, right? Okay. They, they, as much as they want to control a lot of things, there are certain layers they don't want. They don't want to directly employ players. They don't want direct liability to players. Why right? is that though? Because that comes with a whole headache. It's a bunch of additional people that you have to manage. There's you know risks associated with that of like, if there's an injury or something goes wrong. Then counter, -ar wait, to, counter argument. Yep. Mm -hmm. They pay these these orgs right now like millions of dollars a year right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, like they just wipe that from the books and just hire people to do all this shit and pay play pay, pay players like a fraction of that. And the players would be like greening out. They'd be so fucking happy about this. Like they would they would love it, right? Like they would finally be able to keep their salaries, like the VC money that they're currently getting because they're getting the dev money. And the dev money is like insane. Like I've seen from having worked with pop dog like what the devs pay creators oh for sure and it's it's like unreal like it's, it's unreal 
And if players had access to like the dev money, like I think they're turning their backs on the the orgs in like a heartbeat. I'm not gonna lie. Like yeah, well, players would just go where they're gonna. <laughs> yeah. where they feel like they're gonna have the best overall situation, right? I, I don't think it overly matters to the players who's employing them. They want to compete at the highest level, right? And they want to make the they want to have the best situation they can for that. Which is uh, obviously compensation is a huge part of that. As is right. What are the training opportunities? What's your experience like? What's your housing like? What's the full? You know, you know this better than I do. What's the 360 degrees of what you care about as a pro player? There's no doubt in my mind a publisher can replicate that. I don't think they ever will. I think that there are, in addition to like the legal risk hurdles, there's enormous amount of logistics of hiring out to figure out how we're going to operate all these teams. How do you make it actually like competitive and fair? You need like a meaningful arm's length transaction from that so that these businesses operate competitively one another. It's sports. We want everyone to be out for themselves to win, right? To create the best product on the server or on the field. And I'm not sure that happens fully in-house. Now, there's a version of this, right? Like MLS structure where it's a single entity model and all the teams are owned at the league level. But that's not the same thing as like operational control that you're describing where Riot actually owns and operates 10 teams in Valorant and 10 teams in League of Legends in North America, and they do the same thing all over the world. I think that that would be pretty, that would be very far afield from everything they've done in esports so far. I'm not sure that they're particularly incentivized to do that. I don't think that there's a lot of upside in that for them relative to orgs. Because, yeah, they're spending a bunch of money on, on orgs in Valorant, right, where they're they're subsidizing. They're not in other games where they provide baseline revenue sharing connection with the, with the league, but not stipends for participation. Um, but I don't think that they're going to, like, save... I don't think Riot's going to, like, save a bunch of money by doing this. I think it probably costs them more. I'm not sure they do it as well. I'm not sure it actually works. I think there could be fan backlash. Like, I think there's a lot of reasons why this is unlikely to happen. But I could be wrong. This is part of what's fun about esports. We're still really early days. We have not experimented... No one has experimented with something like this. What it would it would look shock like to do me. so? It really wouldn't shock me, though. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at, like, the trajectory of Riot Games, like, they came in as, like, a dev. They became the TO over time. And then now they're getting the platform. And what comes next? It's the yeah. teams. That would theoretically make sense. Like, they've done a lot that I wouldn't think that a dev would do. And it wouldn't shock me if they took that route. Now, I think it would be big backstab to the esports industry to do something like that mm -hmm. and i don't like that I idea but it wouldn't surprise me like it wouldn't like i'm not for that idea but mm -hmm. would it would it shock me no it wouldn't really shock me i mean have you seen like strike have you gone to striker in seattle do you know what i'm I talking about no, so no. riot games i put in the chat just now have um this thing called striker which is basically like this broadcast facility oh and yeah yeah, yeah. This is the, the seattle yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. It's currently in like I Dublin, Ireland, which is where things like kind of go through, right? And they're having one like ones created in like Seattle and Korea, maybe, maybe China. Uh, there's definitely one in Asia being made right now. So like they're making crazy plays that I just would never ever have imagined like a developer spending this money mm -hmm. right now. And I guess my question coming out of this is like, why are they doing this instead of working with? influencers like epic games is because we talked about valve and we talked about riot but the elephant in the room is like fortnite and how they approached it right like they thought esports was the play and i think riot riot is so invested in esports because of their initial bet like you said that they put in like 2012 2013 where they envisioned esports being the thing but i think after quarantine i would argue that the content creation economy and like influencers within gaming have so much more pull than the esport itself. So how do these devs like argue that? Because that's like the key problem with esports in my opinion. It's not that esports is a problem and that like no one watches it, it can't have money. The problem is that it's always gonna be competing against content creators. Yep. And that doesn't really exist to an extent in like traditional sports. Like, you know, Michael Jordan streaming at the YMCA isn't competing with the NBA, like when he was a player. Like, that's not a thing. So, I don't like why do the devs lean esports side and spend so much when I think their value could be greater elsewhere? And that is my biggest worry with esports. 
Well, so not a lot of them do, for what it's worth, right? A lot of a lot of devs do lean more towards creator spend from a marketing perspective than they do esports, especially recently, right? You're talking about the current trends. Riot has shifted his policy on this dramatically. Riot was yeah. very almost hostile to influencers in connection with League of Legends for a huge part of its history. And, you know, Tyler one was banned and he was persona non grata. And then, you know, fast forward uh, not that many years and he's like on the stage at the LCS finals and helping hype the crowd and a part of the broadcast and doing a co-cast and all that different stuff, right? Um, you know, for a long time, the notion of co-streaming would have been anathema to, to Riot's processes and systems. And now it's a huge part of not just Valorant esports, but all their esports, right? Like I, Frodan does the big co-stream for TFT that I take part in. There's co there are major co-streams for League of Legends, and it's all happening around the World Championship right now. Co-streaming is a gigantic part of the Valorant viewership ecosystem, and Riot has embraced that. So I think Riot's trying to figure out a world in which to yes and. I think that there's sometimes a, a little bit of a, a false dichotomy happening here where I don't think it's like, well— you you invest in esports, you invest in influencers, you can't really do both, and it's a, you know, take money from here to go over here. I think there's very much a world in which you can put these two things together in a cohesive strategy, and they do different things on some level, right, in terms of what esports bring to the table, this aspirational, top-line, competitive dynamic in a game, and the ability to watch other people do whatever is the very best that can possibly be achieved within within a particular game. And then influencers can enhance the experience around that, enhance the community engagement, bring a different feel to the viewership. I think there's a lot of things that esports can do or esports can do in conjunction with influencers. But there are gonna be lots of games that say, you know what, esports is just not gonna be a core part of our strategy. We'll do some competitions, but they'll probably really be influencer for competitions, competitive integrity, investing in like identifying who's the best of the best of the best of this game is not actually that important to our mission. And that's that's where the concept of the outlier esport comes back to the fore because the reality is most esports should not be what Counter Strike is or League of Legends is. Just like most sports should not be what basketball or football is, right? Like every once in a while you have a new sport that emerges and tries to kind of break into that, like pickleball is having a moment right now and <laughs> growing exponentially, which is cool. But Ultimate Frisbee, you know, badminton. Table tennis, are these sports ever going to become marquee sports with that kind of production and investment and attempted monetization by them? No, they are not. That is not That is not going to be a thing that happens. Even sports that are like iconic part of the history of sport, right? Like track and field. This awesome, It's the history of sport. It's awesome. But outside of every four years of the Olympics, does anyone give a shit? Not really. No. No. And... I mean, like, the reason why you know esports isn't going anywhere is just the competitive nature of humans, right? Like, if you're going to sink thousands of hours into a game, you're going to want to compete in it. Like, you're going to want to show that you're the best. And so esports aren't going to go anywhere. And the, the key thing is, just like, how will the growth look, really? And, like, where is it going to come from? And what's the path? And, like, where's the money going to come from? Mm -hmm. And when the developer's, like, doing all of the stuff... Do you so do you think it's it's you you clearly think it's not important then that the developer has like all the IP rights because in and like literally rules them cuz in Counter Strike mm -hmm. the developers like you know give the IP rights to the community to have tournaments whenever they want mm -hmm. and is that an important monetization aspect from your experiences for the teams like the ability to make tournaments whenever they want. Say like if Cloud9 wanted to run a tournament in Counter-Strike and try to make it profitable, they could do that tomorrow. They could do yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of ventures on that on the team side. Sometimes it's an individual one-off tournament in a particular game. Sometimes it's an attempt at forming a league with a group of teams, right? You talked about the PA earlier. We could talk about B-Site. There have been multiple, or Flashpoint, I guess, is the public uh name yeah. that right oh, there's yeah. a lot of there's a lot of instances of this i don't think in general teams being able to run competitions has been a huge part of esports monetization or team monetization specifically the notion of outsourcing that part of the business is a really interesting question that every publisher is going to have to answer and the advantage to doing in-house is con the level of control you get the protection of your ip everything goes exactly what you want once you start outsourcing, you're ceding some control. How much control you cede, though, is part of that transaction, right? Valve chooses to cede almost total control. They don't really participate. They, they occasionally, like, descend from on high to be like, you guys fucked up and you are banned for life. Or, <laughs> yes. like, you know, coaches 
are not going to be a thing anymore or whatever, right? Every yeah. once in a while, uh, they like descend from Olympus and they make a decree and the TPC is usually gone. <laughs> like... Yeah, and that and, and and it's usually kind of like a vague decree, right? It's like like somewhere between three and six paragraphs, and afterwards you're like, what does this mean exactly? Uh, and then they're not entirely sure, so everyone asks them questions, like Good questions. We'll figure that out, and then you kind of work through it together, right? That's how that works. Now there is a very clear middle ground here that I, like if I were running a publisher, right? Like let's say let's say that we wave a magic wand and new really popular esports titles stood up and they make me the CEO and they say, build your, your make me that director of esports, build your esports strategy. I would probably try for a middle ground. I'd be like, look, I'm not interested in building out production capability. I don't want to, I don't want to build studios. I don't want to like learn how to run a major broadcast. I'm not sure that I want to teach and in, like in-house figure out how to fully operationalize this from a product perspective, monetize it. But I am very interested in my IP and I'm very interested in protecting this game because this game is everyone. It's always important to remember the game itself is the is the golden goose, right? Yes. And the esport is like one tiny egg. It's like a shit egg that came yes. from the golden goose, right? In comparison to a shit the, egg that just whines nonstop. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Exactly. So it, you know, I I am interested Oof. in esports as my as part of my overall vision, but I want to make sure that this one like kind of shit egg is not is not screwing with this golden goose situation overall and so i would want to be heavily involved i would want to work with someone that i felt like was really reputable that was going to be very invested in protecting my ip that was going to invest at a, in, in a level that made sense to me that was going to be on the ball and and was really thoughtful in everything from you know what is player treatment like what is the broadcast product like but what what does competitive integrity look like you you know it's not an accident that the big competitive integrity like Think about the largest match fixing scandals in the history of esports, right? Or you know, other threats to competitive integrity, cheating, etc. It doesn't typically happen within the riot type of environment where they have full exercise, full control over everything. So there are pros and cons to both sides, and I think that finding a middle ground here is probably what a lot of the future of esports looks like on the publisher level. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. Like I think it is going to be a middle ground. Diving into like the team side, like because we're kind of like bridging into it, right? Mm -hmm. um, like how how do you foresee the teams being profitable, and is there any team that's doing it well right now? I, I linked a video actually, like in the chat. Like uh, I don't know if you got a chance to watch this yet. It's a great video that Sideshow, a colleague of mine. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm gonna say colleague. We're like animals though. We're just broadcast talent. We're not fucking colleagues. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're literally animals compared to your colleagues. But uh, he basically talks about Carmine Corp and Loud and how they have fandom around their their teams, right? And how Loud in particular has like several you know, sister companies and a parent company that overruns it all. Like they, they operate a lot in music and Carmen, Carmen Corp uh, owned and operated by like the big influencers in France. And I think both of these orgs have something that I don't even know is possible in North America, which is like some kind of localized fan base. Because right now there, it feels like there's an oversaturation of NA orgs. And I, that's a hard thing for me to even say out loud, but um I don't think that these things are necessarily possible right now for some of these North American orgs. And I don't think that it's from like a lack of trying either. Like I think, you know, like he talks about how they've hired content creators and stuff like that. Like I see a lot of NA orgs hiring content creators, but the problem is, is that they're, those things are way more expensive in the US to hire those content creators and to get the content made. Whereas you look in like Brazil, the cost of labor is significantly less. So do you agree with these two teams having cracked the code? And, you know, like if so, or if not, like who else is doing it right? I know some amount about both those businesses, but not extreme amounts. So I probably can't speak to them with crazy authority. I will say, I don't think there's one code to crack. I think that part of what makes esports teams really interesting as businesses is that they are not nearly confined in what they can do in connection, in relation to traditional sports. You know, a traditional sports team by and large, is IP exclusive to a single sport, cannot use that elsewhere, and has extreme limitations on what they can do with that IP outside the context of that sport, and has revenue sharing obligations as it relates to the use of the IP, regardless of context. So it, if you're the Yankees, and I talk about this example in my, in my essay, if you're the Yankees, you have a globally recognized brand that is super valuable and powerful, but you're tied to a sport that is literally dying. 
And I don't think baseball is going to die, die, but it's America's favorite pastime yeah. and name only and has been for some time, right? Imagine if you could be the Yankees in football or in basketball, sports that are don't have quite the same level of headwinds or maybe even have tailwinds in some areas, right? That could be enormously valuable. That's an opportunity that teams have, but it's not just the opportunity to go to their sports. They can do whatever they want. You can be 100 thieves and you can try to build supreme right for gaming within yeah. the confines you can go build your own version of an energy drink or a keyboard company peripherals whatever like you can do these things and you're not restricted from doing them because you don't have ip exclusivity with a league that prevents you from going down that rabbit hole you could be tsm and you could stand up a web properties business like blitz and the other properties they have there are so many different avenues that you can go down you can be more kind of influencer integrated and influencer forward in the way that loud is and carmine is right so there are lots of options now I think it's important when we're talking about like who's doing it well. There's a broad-based sentiment within the esports community that esports teams, particularly in the West, have have been you know failed ventures, flawed ventures. There's a lot of criticism, and I think that there's some very fair criticism. And we get into it in the essay series. I point out the yeah. ways in which I think teams have made some kind of first principle mistakes as it relates to the development of the business, but. I think it's important to set the stage here if we're going to talk about teams, which is that if you're looking at the landscape and you don't understand the history of how we got here and what's going on, then you, you're not really in a position to talk about this at all. No. So, so to your to your point as it relates to like you know, how, are there too many teams? Yeah, there are. There are too many teams in the West in relation to the market size right now. Uh, there are too many teams that have raised more than ten million dollars. And that has had a profound and largely negative impact on the entire team's marketplace. Because when you think about it, if you get let's say that let's say that we could just decide how many how many of any type of business could win. There can be three search engines, or there can be five, you know, car washes in the city of Seattle that are successful, or there can be ten major esports teams in North America that could be successful. Pick a number. Well, there is a number. There's always an outside number based on Supply and demand, right? Basic economic principles. There's only so many car washes that can possibly be successful in the city of Seattle. There are only so many esports teams that can possibly be successful in North America. Well, they all raise money on the dream of we're going to be one of those people, right? We're going to be one of those businesses. We're going to be with that team that's marquee that's going to be here for 100 years and you want to bet on us. So there were a lot of teams in the market that, that created very bad dynamics where you had extreme competition for players because everyone in order to stay relevant needed to sign the best players it created a feeding frenzy where this is responsible for the driving up of player salaries where player salaries were largely divorced from revenue generation right it was hey i need to stay relevant i need to win i need to sign the best talent I need to sign the biggest talent in order to be successful as an organization especially if i want to beat out all these other guys right there's 20 teams that have all raised 10 million dollars we know only 10 of us are going to survive i need to beat these guys I want to beat these guys. I got to spend money to do that. I got to stay relevant. Everyone's costs ballooned, okay? And revenues were not in a position to be able to do that. You couldn't sit on the sideline, by the way. That was not an option. If you were an esports team, you were one of these 20 teams, you raised money, people want to see you be competitive. They want to see you be successful. You can't look around and be like, well, everyone's overspending on talent. So I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, then you're just not relevant to this conversation anymore, right? If you're not going to spend for the talent, if you're not going to go compete in the biggest games and be relevant in those games, then what are you? What are you doing? And yeah. so, and, and it also had a weirdly negative impact on the revenue side, where if you were a, an endemic brand that wanted to sponsor, or if you were a streaming platform or whatever, and you wanted to pay money to someone to capture it, it was a little bit of a race to the bottom. Hey, this team's willing to do that sponsorship for 300 grand. Why would I do it with you for a million dollars, right? And you sell all the reasons why you're bigger, you're better, whatever. But at the end of the day, if you're a if you're you know sponsorship manager who wants to sponsor a couple of esports teams, and if you can use ten percent of your budget instead of thirty percent of your budget, you might do that. That dynamic played out across the space and created an environment in which it was functionally impossible for all of these teams to win. And it was very challenging for even a few of them to win. And there are some teams that have done a better job. I actually cannot answer your question of like who's doing it well because I have you know, an alarming of course, amount of, yeah. of non-public information as it relates to things yeah. like their, you know, revenue generation and their P&L more generally and things like that. So I can't get into that, but there are teams that have done better. There are teams that have done worse, but this market correction we're going through this esports winter, it's going to have the impact of some teams dramatically scaling back. A lot of teams are going to close. That is a net good for the industry. 
right? Because there were too many of them for this to actually work. And, and we're going to reduce down to a number that's more sustainable and maybe we'll grow organically from there and new attempts will be had and some teams that were otherwise successful are going to fail. But I think it's, I know that's a really long-winded kind of setting in the stage. Oh, I think good. it's super important if we're going to talk about teams that people understand these, this dynamic because that's what's going on. And that's the landscape where the, win the winter is really happening. I think you worded that perfectly. I love the uh, the car wash analogy. Like, you know, if you're going to go to all these sponsors, even if it's like an endemic sponsor, say like HyperX again, like, you know, like you're competing against all of these teams who have slightly different business models that could then scoop that sponsorship money up. Like a phase, for example, or, yep. you know, like even like, now misfits has like kind of pivoted out of esports into like content creation like they're still in these pitches like trying to get the budget from these companies right like they are competing against your cloud nines against your you know like nrgs all these teams right and kind of asking a question related to that do you think that's directly related to valve esports do you think that's like valve sin here is that their open ecosystem has allowed these these organizations to exist because in riot's ecosystems there's no fucking way there's like 10 teams in north america yeah so riot artificially capping the number of teams has the impact of closing it down but there were more than enough of these franchise slots to go around if you look at call of duty and overwatch and league of legends especially if you include league of legends europe which for the purposes of this conversation we have to because True. there's a number of the european slots that got grabbed up by north american backed or based organizations um so there was more than enough for there to be a lot of t more teams in the market than probably made sense. Uh, it didn't help that some of these franchise fees were way too high for what they were as well. And that also created significant market pressure. Um, I don't know that I would lay the blame at Valve's feet. I don't yeah. think that the, the existence of prominent esports that have... Uh, that that have an open ecosystem is, has been harmful. If anything, it's been helpful, actually. I think that if you look at the P&L for a lot of esports teams, a lot of these teams actually found their core success in games like Counter-Strike, where yeah. they could model it all out and it made sense financially and you only invested so far as made sense kind of on your P&L. Um, and it allowed for third-party competition organizers to thrive and you know build build structures that allow for collaboration between the organizer and the teams at a different level right if you're a riot and you're you have these partner teams and you work with them to a certain extent but it's really your show still whereas if you build something like what the you know has, exists around the esl pro league where it's genuinely collaborative and they've spoken you know extensively with the louver agreement it's something that you know i worked on extensively my firm worked on extensively but it's uh it's a different opportunity and one that I think has been valuable in general for esports writ large. Although I do, I, I will say that like if one, one thing that has been beaten into me, actually I got beat up by Thor on a podcast like <laughs> eight years ago and I'll never forget. I probably great, watched it. it, it, it yeah, probably. It was a great learning experience for me because it's important to recognize that when we're talking about like what's good for esports or bad for esports, there's no real, that's a, it's, it's a, it's false so, narrative. There's nothing yeah. that's like good for esports. It, it it totally depends on your lens. Who are you, and what are your what do you want? What are your incentives? So, you know, I, I'm speaking to it from the perspective of of this question of team businesses and their financial viability. I think that there are certain things that Valve's open ecosystem has been very outstanding for, like the existence of third-party TOs. If everyone went the Riot model, then third-party TO business couldn't exist anymore. Um, and then there have been ways in which it's been harmful as well. Okay, so other side of the coin, what are Riot and Blizzard to blame for creating these franchise leagues with $20 million, $10 million buy-ins where the teams then have to take rounds and get VC money, and then they end up in this situation where they don't fully own their company, they're reporting to a board, you know, like, like you said, like they need to make splashes, like they need to pick up big players, they need to win, they need to go back to these people that now own their company and say like, hey, this is what we're doing. And this is like, look at us, we're winning now, look at all of this exposure we're getting. And ultimately, this is kind of what caused the salaries to initially inflate. The salary inflation initially came from League of Legends. I remember seeing it as a CSGO player, like, yeah, making like, I'm just gonna say like $2,500 a month, like mm -hmm. on, you know, like a top team at that time and looking over the, at, like the other side and I'm seeing like League of Legends making like a million dollars a year and, you know, like their numbers weren't significantly higher than yeah. ours. Like I was, I was very confused by it all. 
but in hindsight now i understand a little bit more about it do you think that those developers have a role to play in how we got here and do you think like uh like import restrictions are a key part of that because like bringing in these these players from other regions where you're competing with people that aren't playing by our rules i'm going to be honest like you're competing with billionaires like over in asia that just own their team like edward gaming like if you're going to try to outspend yeah. edward gaming you're in big goddamn trouble you're in <laughs> yeah. big trouble like good luck like and but you have to win at the same time so like is that a problem Oh, there's a lot to unpack there. So, okay, first thing I want to say is I think it's interesting that you noted that, like, you saw it because you guys also used it, right? Like, a big part of what caused Counter-Strike salaries to rise was rising League of Legends salaries. And I remember all those conversations and negotiations as you guys were like, wait a second, like, you guys can pay us less, but you can't pay us this much less. And you know what? Orgs are like, fair play. You're right, actually, right? This is really popular, and the economics have recalibrated, and so it doesn't make sense. Now, eventually, it got out of control all around, and it got, you know, the whole industry recalibrated up and up and up until it was completely unsustainable. But I think it was very fair, what you guys were arguing at the time, that you should be paid more money, and I think that's a, you know, was a good thing that happened as a result of it. Uh, okay, to the, you know, how much blame do I lay with the publishers? I want to, taking a step back, I lay blame with a little bit of everybody. Yeah, I think course. everybody, yes, yes. you know, I, I don't think that anybody is, like, directly responsible for these core problems. I will say that, uh, actually, if there's a group that I don't lay blame with, it's the players. I, I, whenever anyone is like, players should have... Well, okay, at least in this way. Whenever people say to me, players should have taken less money, they knew they weren't worth it. I'm like, I don't know what fucking no, planet you're living on, but that's just not how the world works we live in a capitalist society there was there were multiple bidders in the marketplace for their services and they we shopped them around to get the highest bidder and they did that time and time again and then ultimately player salaries got to a place where that, that were not sustainable it was not incumbent upon the players to take less money uh i i will not hear that argument i think that is just an asinine pov i think players contributed in some other ways though um as which the publishers i don't think that the existence of franchise leagues ha ha has been the core problem i think that you know, League of Legends in North America is waning a little bit, but I don't think that it's fair to call, like, the LCS as a full failure. I, you know, I think that it's had a lot of good years, and time will tell how it plays out, if whether or not it's able to rebound at all. I think the notion of franchise leagues created an enormous amount of stability and predictability, which was huge for org businesses and, therefore, for the investment in org businesses. True. And I think whatever people criticize the notion of franchise leagues, look, there are trade-offs, for sure. Open ecosystems absolutely in general, produce like more cutthroat talent experience and you're going to get, you know, rise to the best because the bad teams are just going to get relegated out. Is it actually producing the best play? I'm not convinced that it is because part of what you get when you get franchising is you get more investment in player wellness and training. You get better facilities. You get more coaching. You get more resources poured into actually achieving the best. Now, it's impossible to prove the counterfactual. We don't know what it would look like if Counter-Strike had franchise leagues and you would compare like this marquee final to if it had franchise leagues and is the Counter-Strike play actually better. I, I don't know, but I think that there's been pretty reasonable arguments that the play gets better when you invest in these things, right? We're better mm. at basketball today than we were at basketball 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, even five years ago. That's an objective fact. It it's is. not hard. It's yes. it's not actually hard to see. Like the three point line had to move back for a reason. <laughs> if the three, if everyone could shoot as well 30 years ago as it did today, then they would have moved it back 30 years ago. Cause it would have just been ridiculous, right? It was like way too easy to score yeah. three points. Um, and there's lots of examples we could talk about in traditional sports that prove this out. So I don't think that it's, that franchising is inherently bad for for competitive play, but there are definitely trade offs as it relates to like teams knowing that they have permanency and not worrying about short term competitive success or even long term competitive success in some extreme examples. Now, some of these things were overpriced for what they were, for sure, and I think you can lay blame at the feet of Blizzard over, Blizzard Activision, particularly in in connection with this, because you had an analog at the same time when when Blizzard was selling Owl franchises for $20 million. Riot was selling League franchises for $10 million. True. No one, no one thought that an Overwatch League franchise was worth more than a League of Legends franchise. When you know, when these things hit the P&L of an esports team, like what they were actually issued, they would get marked up because they were. it was a thing you had to apply for, you had to get access to. It was not easy, particularly on the League of Legends side. And so there was a scarcity, and so they were immediately marked up. League of Legends franchises were always worth more. Riot was just optimizing for something different. 
They wanted to be able to pick their partners. They wanted maximum number of applications so they could pick the very best people that they thought for the role. They didn't want to put too much financial pressure on their partners because they knew that these businesses were raising venture capital money. And it was not hard to predict that we were going to get here. The, the part, one of the funny things about this essay project is that it's something we've been talking, Ovi and I have been talking about this for six, seven years. This was always going to happen. We were always yes. going to have this winter. And so... Yeah, I think it is fair to put blame on the on Blizzard Activision to a certain extent for choosing to price their franchising the way they did in connection with Overwatch, a brand new game, and Call of Duty, a game that had been around for a really long time, and we had a lot of good data as it related to how popular that game was going to be, and I think not a lot of reason to believe that franchising of Call of Duty was going to make it 3x more popular, 4x more popular, in spite of some of the things I heard coming out of the mouths of some of the people working on that at the time. So... I think it's fair to lay some blame there, but people bought them. So uh, is it fair to blame the people who no. sold the thing? Or do you blame the people who bought the thing? And then it goes back to what we were talking about, the venture capital money and the rising player salaries and the need to stay relevant. And there were a lot of people who bought these things thinking, this is how I stay relevant. Not necessarily because they liked the bet they were making, but because they felt like it was the bet they had to make. So this is all interrelated and complicated. And there's a reason why this essay series is 30,000 words and yes. barely scratching the surface. Yeah, exactly. I want to table the player salary thing because I, I agree completely. Like it's got out, gotten out of control. But while we have like the devs and the teams now, do you think there was any world where I'm going to show you a link really quick. So this happened over a decade ago. Um, 2011, Blizzard and Kespa settled over rights for StarCraft broadcasting rights, where, have you have you looked into this ever? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is one of the really interesting legal issues that rose before I got into the space, and yeah. so I spent a bunch of time looking at it once I was in the space. Yeah. Do you think that the orgs, with all of that VC money, could have somehow banded together to get more out of the devs, like via the IP rights? Like, do you think it's... Do you think that, you know, they could have fought for, say, like even making T-shirts with like Timo on it or, you know, Tracer or not Tracer, like Tracer. Yeah, even Tracer, sure. like, you know, like um, any of the agents in Valorant, like Harbor or something like, you know, is it is it too outrageous? The IP clamp that the devs have. And is it ever possible for something like that to be public domain? OK. Public domain, no, that is very unlikely to be a thing. There are some theories as it relates to um, whether or not the use of it at a certain level, like, is form of creative expressive, is it transformative to thereby, like, take IP rights in this game that are clearly held by a publisher and give them over to the player of the, of the game for doing something creative and new and expressive, whatever. My understanding from talking to experts in that field, because that is not my bread and butter, is that, uh, that those arguments are quite poor and that they're mm. fun intellectual theories, but not actually realistic. So the IP clamp that exists in esports is fairly ironclad, at least based on the way the law works right now. Um, I feel like that would especially be true in Riot games where they're constantly updating them. At least in oh, Valve's yeah. games, they're like not updating them at all. Like they don't really you know, like tell you anything to do like throughout the calendar year. So like, they're not really too much in control of their IP, like in a lot of ways. So it'd be very hard to argue in a Riot Games ecosystem that it's public domain because they are so active. Yeah, I I'm, I have not spent a lot of time thinking about the public domain argument, but I would be pretty flabbergasted if there was, yeah. a, if there was a good full articulation of that. Um, so what that means is, you know, to, to answer your other question, like do, should the teams have banded together with all this VC money to get more out of the devs? I wrote about this like almost a decade ago, actually. One of the first, Ooh. one of the first white paper that white paper series I told you about that kind of launched my career. Um, one of the things I wrote about was collective bargaining in esports. I think it was the third white paper, Ooh. and one of the things that I hypothesized. Uh, let me see. I'll, I'll try to find it for you because you're gonna have a I'm lot. I'm literally of... googling it right now. Uh, Price Bloom collective bargaining in esports. I'm sure. Hi. Yeah, maybe. I'm, Bly I'm Price Bloom, the original esports attorney from, 2000, <laughs> from 2017 on Reddit. Right now. There you go. I think you're gonna have trouble finding it because it was published on the. Uh, it was published on the uh, Foster Prepper website. It was published on that on that law firm website, and they've since been acquired. So I, I, I it probably exists on my on my LinkedIn page. I can probably find it for you. Like I think I published it there way back when. But what I hypothesized at the time, and I still believe this to this day, is that 
while we think about the experience of traditional sports as teams versus players, that the existence of the publisher and their ironclad IP protections suggests to me that we were actually going to get to a, a if we do get to a point where people are banding together to try to get more out of out of the game developer or the publisher, it's going to be players plus teams mm. against Riot because or against the developer more generally because when you think about it outside of like player salaries and your player contract transaction players and teams are a lot more situ similarly situated uh vis-a-vis -a, -vis a publisher than they are apart what they really want is like more seat at the table more involvement in structural decision making more revenue sharing more transparency all of this stuff is really lockstep one-to-one -one players and orgs and i think you need you would need that kind of collective influence and voice to ultimately get there because Teams doing it alone probably is enough. Players doing it alone probably is enough. I'm not even sure teams and players doing it together is enough. But I think that if you want to have a shot, that's what it would look like. Now, if we if we look at the historic moments of attempts at team collaboration, can teams make a union? Is that possible for like a, a group of teams? Yeah, you definitely could. You could certainly form a bargain. You could form a bargaining unit, um, right? I don't know if they. I don't know if they could would create like a full blown union. Uh, Sorry, I'm not sure I, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, not at all. No, it's a great. It's a great question. Yeah. It's part and parcel of this whole thing because if you think about the history, right? Like the PEA in North America, WESA in Europe yeah. were really similar attempts at teams banding together to try to do something collectively which could be building their own thing. It could be advocating for their interests vis-a-vis -vis players or, or publishers or third-party organizers. Those efforts never really came to fruition. Similarly, player attempts at unionization or collaboration have, have mostly been failure to launch examples, right? Like there's been lots yes. happening with the LCSPA recently and that, <laughs> you know, is not, it, it, I think highly of some of the people involved in that venture, but, uh, but the, it has not ultimately borne fruit for the players, I, I think is a fair way of describing it. They've done some things, and and that's good. But it hasn't been like a players are fully collective and ready to you know fight and get what get bigger picture concessions from a developer. The CSPPA existed for a little bit, but yeah. I haven't heard about them in years, right? So, I think if you were ever actually going to really do what you're talking about, if you want to shake the, shake the tree, shake you know to use your original kind of visualization for this, then you would really need players and teams together lockstep in a way that I don't think we've seen either of them do individually no. and the notion of it happening collectively you know it sounds really hard but i think that's what it would take it would literally be like a miracle if that happened like i would it would blow my goddamn mind and yeah i remember um so i was actually involved in like the csppa formation yeah. and um you know I, I don't know what has happened since since i like came into valorant i kind of like completely stepped away from it because it just wouldn't have been fair to the association yeah but it, I, I do remember it was, like, very hard to get, like, anything done. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you – to just, like, walk into a room and be like, hey, this is my seat at the table. And, like, the people that are actually, like, you know, running shit and making money are like, the fuck it is? Like, that's not your fucking mm -hmm. seat. Or they're like, yeah, here's the toddler chair over there. Like, you know, like, yeah. they have no reason to do those things. You know, like, none. And so, like, that's when, when, when the public – was so critical back in the day like you know this player union or that player union has no teeth or this player stepped out of line and did this or that it's it is so hard because unlike traditional sports esports has no barriers so you know like the player association cs was created in denmark like you know, like so they have to what be aware of the laws like all around the world yeah. And in a Valve ecosystem, like how, I remember it was like a huge problem for us. It was like, how deep are we going to go? Like, what is a pro player? Someone that makes like $50 a month, $200 yeah. a month, like $100 a month. Like, what, what is the number? Like, what, yeah. what classifies a pro player? And who are you to determine that? Because say like $50, say you make $50 in like a country where that could be worth a lot more than obviously like America, where you know, like that would be like nothing. So it is there's so many hurdles to overcome when it comes to like even unionizing just on one front let yeah. alone like both of them like coming together i think everything you're saying is completely true there are enormous hurdles to actually like forming a union be, making it actually be a union right the lcspa is not a union the csppa was i believe under danish law only um so figuring that out legally globally and then there's a big one that i think gets missed and this is historical context right if if a union wants to if you want to like more than the toddler chair to use your to use your you know analogy if you want to be 
if you want to really fight for like a real seat at the table, co-equal structural power and decision making, you got to be willing to fight, fight, like fight, fight yes. for it. Right. I mean, look at what the screenwriters guild just went through. They had to like shut Dude. down their business for months. They had to pick it all over the place. They had to engage in like a massive PR campaign and they got hard won concessions. So to get everything they wanted, no, but they actually got a ton of stuff and it was really good overall, but it was really hard. And there were a lot of sacrifices made by all the people that were involved in order to make that a reality. So then you have to ask yourself, do you think that the players in any given esports? Oh, also, are... also related to that, yeah. I had offers from my agent. Like, are you willing to do these things in this industry? Like, are you willing to like, you know, do an ad for like a movie or something? And the the thing was, is if I did it, I would never ever be allowed to join that guild. Like, yeah, you know, like even as a content creator, right? Like, yeah. so you know, like those are really like lines that these these organizations and groups have to draw and yeah these, you know people are definitely gonna be rubbed the wrong way and of course like i'm not gonna say yes i have no idea what's in my future so i'm like i don't want that i don't want that money like yeah i don't care that much about that's, it like, yeah that's blood money over yeah, there like, I, I, like, I'm, money. I'm not gonna cross the picket line i don't know these people but like i'm not gonna be the yeah. person that screws them over right someone will probably do it but it's not gonna be me and yeah. yeah, you're right. You have to take these types of hardline approaches. That's how all unions ultimately work, right? That's your great tool when you're doing something like this. And you have to just be honest with ourselves about the state of esports players in 2023, which is if you look at the formation of player unions in traditional sports, they were coming from a much different place. They were athletes were severely mistreated. Their bodies were breaking down. They were full-time employees of other things who were then playing these sports on the side. They didn't had, there were extreme restrictions on player mobility. They weren't getting paid anywhere near their market value. There were all these things, all these ways in which they were being screwed over in huge ways. And then you juxtapose that to an esports player that has been generally speaking overcompensated relative to what like if we were if everyone was priced based on revenue generation right then they've likely made more money yes. now the market dictated they should make that money again i'm not blaming them i'm not i don't want to take that from them but that's the reality they've, they've probably been overcompensated as opposed to sports where they were extremely undercompensated in a lot of ecosystems like in a riot ecosystem they receive significant protections right riot has all sorts of guarantees of employment agreements standards in their agreements minimum get you know minimum uh, requirements and player contracts and things like that you know there's a there's all sorts of things that players have their baseline level of treatment by the publisher by the organization is it's not even apples to oranges with the formation of players unions traditional sports it's apples to lug wrenches players <laughs> in general if you were to compare the life of an esports pro in a tier one game in 2023 in the west to the life of an nba player in 1950 1960 or an nfl player or an nhl player or whatever it's just not the same and so it's hard to, for me to see the incentives lining up for players to like really band together and take this type of action in this environment. There, there's just way too much going for them. Their lives are already too good. Can it be improved? Are there things that they wish were different? Of course. Will they talk about things? those things, advocate for those things? Of course. Will it become a union? Maybe someday. We're not there yet. Yeah. I, I hate the comparisons to traditional sports, by the way. Like, I, that's something that, like, I initially in esports, I was like, oh, it's just like traditional sports. But as time went on, mm -hmm. I was like, this is so goddamn different. So and different. how the money flows. And mm -hmm. this is, like, the core thing of what we've been talking about. Like, the, the money flows from the developer. They own the game, right? Whereas, like, no one owns football. So yeah. what ends up happening is, is, like, you know, the I mean, in, so in Riot Games, we talked a little bit about co-streamers. Yep. I don't know what your thoughts are on it. I've been, obviously, like, I was a player. I've been broadcast talent, mm -hmm. and now I'm a content creator, and I kind of, like, put my hands in all the pots. Yep. As broadcast talent, it obviously, like, it's very frustrating, right? Like, it's very frustrating because you just feel like you're just drowned out, right? Like, everything in a Riot broadcast feels like it's for the aesthetics, for the co-streamer, because that's where their audience, that's their bread and butter, right? And from a developer point of view, you have to be like, well, co-streaming co makes total sense. Like all we care about are eyes on this fucking game. Like we don't, we don't give a shit if this makes, if we can like turn profit on the actual tournament. Now Counter-Strike operates very differently where the actual dev doesn't run the tournaments. Yep. So 
there's a tournament organizer that actually needs to turn a profit. Do you think co-streaming is a problem in this space? Because I actually have grown to like it, yeah. but I also see its problems. So I think back to what I was talking about before of like, is it a problem? Well, that depends a lot on your lens. Who yeah. you are and what you what you care about is going to completely answer that question for you. I don't view it as a problem. I I think, you know, holistically, it's very clear. It's a product that people clearly want. People want to watch sports in a more casual environment. They like the feel. There's a reason why traditional sports are aping esports on this, right? Like, the, you know, the Manning broadcast and all sorts of examples of traditional sports saying, wait a second, like, there's a version of this that might attract a different audience and get people to stay for longer. So it's not – co-streaming is not the enemy of esports no. writ large. If anything, it's an ally, right? It's another way of getting the content consumed and people really enjoy it. Now, it does create hurdles, and depending on who you are, that can be particularly challenging for you, right? Like you said, if, you're, if you care mostly about the marketing of the game, you don't care where it's being watched. You don't care if it's on your main broadcast that, you know, 100,000 people are going to watch it here, 100,000 people are going to watch it there. Great. That's more people watching it, right? Now, if you care about the monetization of the broadcast, either because you're a third party, so you don't the marketing of the underlying game doesn't matter to you, or because you're care about it just because you choose to care about it, right? There are a lot of publishers that just think about the esports as marketing. There are other publishers that think, hey, this is marketing, but it's also an opportunity to make some initial money to recoup some of our investment in the development of the esport itself. And so for them, they do care. And then the part of the question becomes, how do you how do you tap into co-streaming? What rules can you create that are fair and reasonable on large creators that want to promote your product so that you can call their numbers, your numbers, tap into them? Is it sponsor overlays is there you know what kind of integration is there how do you make the co-streaming work for your monetization plans and the reality is probably monetization plans have to evolve on some level right yeah. like you can't when you go into a sponsorship deal today you probably shouldn't guarantee that all the viewers you know that there's not going to be co-streamers you should actually contemplate them and, and have negotiate with your co-streamers in advance what kinds of things they're comfortable doing so you can put that into the deal so that you can tap into some monetary value from the co-stream yeah, and tying it all together, like traditional sports make a large portion of their money from broadcast rights, yep. from television deals. But if you're just allowing everyone and anyone to co-stream, how the yep. fuck are you ever going to do that? And also, yep. why as a developer would you ever want to do that? Why would you want to paywall your product when, like I said, like eyeballs is the ultimate goal? So do you think that's like, how do we get past that? If if that's the one of the biggest monetization aspects in traditional sports, and yet it directly conflicts with what the developer wants or theoretically what would make their product better, like it would take an, an insane amount of money for them to sell those broadcast rights. Whereas like in an open ecosystem like Counter-Strike, you know, like it's it's different again. Like mm -hmm. they would sell it to the highest bidder and they would just roll with it. Like Facebook for ESL, for example. Yeah, how'd that go? Uh, Not very good. They're, yeah, they're back. Did, we back. We back. <laughs> we back. <laughs> we Barack. Um, yeah, uh, look, the reality of the situation is that uh, media rights landscape in traditional sports in a state of flux and a state of flux in esports as well. I don't think we're ever going to get to the levels that traditional sports have. That goes without saying. We'd get into the essays. There's a bunch of reasons why. Off the top of my head, a couple of them. One, historically, migration of platform hasn't gone very well. You can't just no. go to Facebook and have it be successful, which hurts the marketplace because it means that someone like Twitch knows that moving off of them is hard. And it means that someone like Facebook is less likely to buy because they know that they're less likely to get the value. Uh, so that's one thing. There's very few marquee players in the space that could be bitter. Really just YouTube and Twitch in the West right now, right? Kick a little bit, Facebook a little bit, I guess, but like not really, right? Yeah. So the lack of competition also is going to mean that rights prices go down. Right? Part of the reason why traditional sports rights are so high is you got lots of people that want to bid for them and that number has increased not decreased you got people like amazon that have entered the fray you know in the last few years that are buying up sports sports media rights and they're you know just paying top dollar for, dollar for it uh we also have an audience that's not used to consuming content behind a paywall so every sports every sports media rights acquisition understands for the most part there's some amount of it happening in public tv but for the most part it's this is gonna be behind a paywall you want to subscribe you want to watch thursday night football subscribe to amazon Right, you want to watch this game or that game of this sport or that sport, you have to have this package or that package. Right now, it's also worth noting that sports media rights are going to start declining relatively soon. Every business analyst under the sun thinks that we're in our heyday, and that as we right now, there's this weird thing of like you 
buy these cable TV packages that include sports, but people yeah. don't want to do that anymore. They just want to buy a la carte, get what you want. Mm -hmm. So I think sports media rights are going to go down, but they're going to stay at a really high, valuable level. It's going to be quite hard for esports to replicate that given all the all the issues I pointed out. So that on the plus side, that can be freeing on some level. You can say, hey, we're not going to sell these giant paywalled exclusive media rights packages. That's not how our audience wants to interact. So we don't have to worry about that as much. We can do things like co-stream and we can find new and interesting ways to monetize that, right? And like the example you gave earlier of an integration as part of the broadcast platform where someone watching gets a special offer and, you know, so there's a, someone gets an ace with this gun skin and then it gets offered on all these co-streams and you get a chance to buy it and you know that you're supporting the co-streamer when you're doing it. That's a that's a new monetization opportunity all around that there is no analog for that in traditional sports. So there's there are benefits to this as well, but it's definitely challenging as it relates to monetization of media rights in esports. Yeah, I think it was like Ovi in your guys' article that even mentioned like, you know, you can like do shit like for a certain, you know, what in some kind of way, with some kind of microtransaction, you can change like the lighting in the arena yes. or yep. you know, like instead of like having it be blue and green like the tsm logo comes down or some shit like you know like all of those things are a sound plays in the arena like anything like you can do things like that. like it is possible yeah. like that we are not operating by traditional sports rules here like that yeah and i feel like that is a problem that we've kind of run into is people have just tried to place traditional sports onto esports yes and i think that's a the closest the, the closest one that i would say would be like golf what are your thoughts on that like where say golf gol well more similar to cs than it is like valorant but you're traveling around the world it's like a cert like a traveling circus right like, like all over the place mm -hmm. people watch you not because it's i mean to an extent sometimes yeah like it is entertaining like i don't play golf but sometimes i'll watch it um but a lot of people that watch golf play golf and they are watching from a perspective of their experiences. And when someone purchases something with golf, it's like, I want that club because Tiger Woods has that club. I want that glove because this person has that glove. I want that putter. I want this. You know, like you can use those things. I know if I buy Michael Jordan shoes, I'm not dunking. There is no fucking purchase that I can make that's going to make me jump to a 10 foot hoop. There is Skills. nothing. Yeah, that's about it. That's about it. They, they are doing that these days, actually. It's kind of crazy. But, uh, yeah, it's uh, – what do you think about the comparison there and, like, everything that I just said? Yeah, I mean, I buy. I think it makes a ton of sense. And I think every sport has different dynamics as it relates to this. Some, you know, certain sports have a lot of stuff that you buy that, like, replicates. Like, golf's a great example where there's bag and clothing and clubs and gloves and balls and shoes. There's, like, yeah. a lot of things, right? In basketball – it's mostly just the shoes, right? People like wearing, you know, whether it's Jordans or the LeBrons or whatever, right? And every star basketball player has their own shoe, and it's like a way of voting with your feet yeah. um, and your and your <laughs> wallet, right? Um, and so there, different sports have these that dynamic. And, it, and it's also, you brought up the, like, people, pe mostly people who watch golf, play golf. This is true in most sports, but it's all a spectrum, right? Yeah. So, like, one of the things that the NF, one of the reasons why the NFL is the NFL and is the, the juggernaut in sports in North America is because they have cracked the code for creating something that very people can not play at yeah. all and never have played and watch. For whatever reason, football is this sport that has this gigantic gap between people who currently play or have ever played and people who watch in relation to every other major sport. I mean, um, baseball. Like, how are you going to get nine? Well, I guess, like, you'd have to get two teams. You want, yeah, like, so 18 people? Like, yeah, it's slightly, it's slightly different questions, right? One is, like, have you ever played the sport seriously, yeah. competitively, whatever, and then it's do you currently? Yeah. Um, and, yeah, you're right. Certain sports like baseball, it's it's a lot harder because it takes a lot of people, and you need a space that's different, whereas basketball, a lot of people will play you know, one -on one-on-one, two-on-two. They'll play in a backyard. They'll play in an alleyway. They'll yeah. play, you know, pick up at a court, whatever. So every sport has different dynamics as it relates to this, and this is one of the interesting things about esports, and every esport is going to be different. Right, there are certain esports that I like. Counter Strike is the best esport that has ever been created for me. For me, it is just the perfect combination of pacing and drama, and there's like situational moments inside of rounds that are amazing, and there's bigger picture buildup that's amazing, and it's slow, and then it's fast, and yes. it's just, and it's it's simple, but it's also so fucking complicated and yeah. and beautiful. And so for me, it's just like has hit all the right buttons that. 
I mean, I played I played a game of CS2, and I will I put that back down, and I'll wait for that game to become a, a real game, and then I'll pick it back up and start playing it. You hit that uh, MJ not, peak? Do you hit the I'm MJ not, peak? Do you want to? I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna be incurring that brain damage. I don't have enough time in my life to want to go through that process, but I will keep watching the hell out of it. When there is a if there's a CS:GO major, if there's a high stakes you know match at the end of a big tournament, I'm gonna tune in because there's nothing quite like it. And every esport is different in this regard. Some esports have more of that feel going on, and some esports are really only watched by the active player base. And understanding who is watching and then adjusting your decisions based on that is important and something that probably isn't done enough in the space. How do you think that we break that barrier? I think you guys talked a little bit about this mm -hmm. in the article where, yeah. you know, I, I think it was Ovi actually. I talked Ovi about gets like, into F1 a yeah, lot. Yeah. Like F1, yeah. And Arcane, mm -hmm. for example, like um, mm -hmm. just to get people like into it, right? Like get people like break down the barrier of like, these are what the characters are. This is what they do. This is like their backstory. Did mm -hmm. you know that video game characters have backstories now? Like, you know, so <laughs> I, like Riot's doing a really good job of mm -hmm. attempting this. I haven't seen it in CSGO. I mean, like other than like world events, too real, too real. Uh, too real. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I... <laughs> I somewhat disagree with Ovi's take on this for it's worth. Yeah. Uh, Ovi, Ovi basically, when he's arguing, like, how do we make this better economically, bigger picture? And one of the things he talks about is trying to trying to pull in a whole bunch of non-esports, non-gamers into this. And while I believe that that is a good goal and should be invested in, in particular, building storylines and making people care about the, the making a human interest story and not just about the competition. I think this is an area where, in general, esports have lagged. Traditional sports do a much better job, by and large, of telling these stories, creating compelling rivalries, like pulling these narratives out of the game so that they're feel, the stakes feel heightened in the game. Um, and esports have had limited moments of this, but in general, I think it's an area we can improve. I don't think we need to go all the way to... F1, you know what allows F1 to do that? There's some, there's a bunch of inherent things about it that are really cool. One, it's outrageously simple to understand. It is just a race. Everyone can understand a race. You don't have to you car go to, fast. Right? Good. Car, car go fast. Good. Exactly. <laughs> he passed this other guy. Good. Or yeah. he got passed by this other guy. Bad. Right. Yeah. Very simple. Um, and I think that's super compelling for pulling in casual fans. Although that's not a requirement because again, football very complicated and yes. has somehow hit the zeitgeist. So there's an element of like. How often is it on? F1 races are once a week. Football is once a week. This is kind of interesting. Why is that interesting? Because there's an element of like, hey, this is an event that we do. It's always on the weekend. It's a thing we tune into. It's a social experience. A lot of what makes football so good casually is no, there are not a lot of people who don't play, have never played football or aren't serious football fans who sit down and watch every Sunday by themselves. They have groups of people. They get together. They have the experience of the football Sunday. They may be slightly less invested in the game, but they're invested in the experience. So I think that's something that we can think about and think about how we can replicate it. But I do think ultimately esports, as much as we're talking about Counter-Strike, like being this pure, simple Counter-Strike in comparison to F1, it's night and day. And then there's also the stakes of F1. Like cars going really fast is something everyone can understand. Everyone is driven, even if they've never driven a car, you know, 250 miles an hour. And it's, people get hurt. People die in F1. Like it's, it feels very real and very serious and that adds to the gravity of what it feels like to be a spectator of it. So I think there's a lot of reasons why that strategy, it was a brilliant strategy and you should, everyone should read his piece on it because he really gets into it and everyone should understand this. If you're, if you're listening this far into the podcast, you're clearly interested in the business of yeah. sport and esport. So go read Ovi's piece because I think it's really interesting and learn about F1. I think it's a fascinating case study. I don't think that esports win by replicating that model in general. No. Maybe a new esport comes out that's like this perfect, it's complex enough to be really compelling esport, but it's really simple and it can be made to feel compelling in that way. Um, but I think that there are very valuable takeaways from that kind of storytelling and narrative development that we absolutely should apply here. Yeah, and I think this is like a pretty good time to bridge back into the players because mm -hmm. I think that is another like little key problem here is the players are way overpaid. And now there's like, I mean, you say there's an oversaturation of orgs. There's probably an oversaturation of players like that are willing to compete at the top level, right? Mm -hmm. Especially after COVID when everyone just stayed home and grinded all the time. I mean, I'm talking to my relatives and they're in fucking like esports programs for their kids at like six years old, yeah. dude. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous. It's actually ridiculous. So for that, like another reason why esports won't die is like, you know, like when people like myself have kids, my kids will inevitably like i'm not gonna say they already watch esports they already play games they don't actually but yeah. i would imagine one day they will and you know like 
the same thing is going to happen like across the board for everyone that plays video games whereas like our parents they didn't have that yep. right so like just the sheer numbers are bound to go up like it has no choice but to go up um but you've seen it a lot in like other esports like hero the heroes of the storm like there's no right. there's no star player like where the fuck is the star player like whereas you look at like counter strike and you look at valorant you can clearly see like you know like demon one oh my god that's like our michael jordan like talking about that's like our scotty pippen like simple that's our michael jordan like there's star player potential and there's storylines that can be built but with all of what you said about like and what we know about like esports winter and salaries going down now what's happening in my eyes is like is the risk reward of attempting to be a pro worth it if you're going to put ten thousand hours into something in the prime years of your life so say like myself like you know like i in order to be a cs pro i was playing there was no money back then so like i was yeah. literally an idiot but i was for playing the love of the game sean for, for the, the love, love of the game. game yeah i was playing like before high school after high school during college like i was in a private study room like teaching myself ditching classes and then i'd go take the exams and like go go like so i could make practice at like 4 p.m you know like i had to do that shit. and then when i had to go for attendance purposes i'd go but if there's no money in esports for the players and no path to building like a life out of this then how is it worth it um it just yeah like i just don't i don't see it and furthermore like what's to stop players from trying to get good and then just switching to a content creator because we see people like say it i mean just to like literally just talk about you know the the king on the mountain like xuc signing like a hundred million dollar deal to kick yeah. like let's be real the money is with the content creators right yeah. now like it and it, an x esports pro right x overwatch league pro yes and Tarek, right shroud and shroud and you name it ninja like a lot ninja so many of the biggest creators are x esports stars which is really interesting um because it means that there's some storytelling going on right there's some brand building that's going on these people are developing initial fan bases but they're going to other stratospheres when they when they leave esports i think there's pretty good reasons for that right content creator can connect with their audience on a full-time basis and esports pro can't and esports pro is mostly focused on their own performance training and improvement and as esports is professionalized the amount of barriers between esports pro and the fans has gone up and the amount of time an esports player has spent creating content or engaging directly with their audience has gone down dramatically i think it's really interesting when you're listing the stars obviously you know with valorant's a new game and so you have new stars but if you look at the the marquee esports titles the superstars are the superstars it's the old you know it's the fakers and the symbols yeah. of the world right for the most part there's some up-and-coming talent and sometimes new talent emerges and becomes one of those staples but i think that there were really significant advantages that people like you had in the early days of esports where content creation and esports professional play was was very interconnected right yeah. like you 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 and a lot and not just you a lot of your peers were building real brands as you were building in part because you were getting paid nothing so yeah. it was like well this i can make i make as much money stream on the side so what do i do i you know do my scrim blocks and then i and then i stream and there was also a culture around streaming scrim blocks for a while and people were constantly streaming their practices and just using it all as opportunities to create content and the amount of behind the scenes content that was being shot we did tell esports player stories for a while, yeah. right? In the in the origin story, like the mid 2010s, uh, the origin of the what I describe in the essay series, the dawning of the modern era, and then before that, we told these stories really well as well. Though I think that the heyday was really in this kind of 20 early 2010s because it was when it, it coincided with the advent of live streaming and social media was blowing up, and so there was a lot of opportunity to connect in this way. And I think we've gotten away from that as we professionalize. I think we've lost a lot of the connectivity between pro players and, uh, and, the, and the core fandom. And I think we've erected a lot of barriers. And I think that is really hurting some of this stuff. And, I, when I, and sometimes I feel old saying this, but I've asked friends who are younger fans of esports that I really try to pay attention and follow. And the reality is that most of the marquee names are older names. They're people that have been around for a while that were part of that culture that kind of came up in that environment and built those brands a long time ago. We're not, not, not doing a good enough job with turning players into celebrities today in esports. Yeah. I, and part of that's on the players too, by the way. Actually, a lot is. of that's on the players. You got to be invested yes. in that if you want. Like, why does it's really interesting to note, like, we're talking about the players who did this. 
you did this, right? You invested in your brand, you built a brand, and that's why you're able to become a caster and be a content creator, right? Tarek invested in his brand. It's something he thought about. Ninja invested in his brand, right? XQC invested in his brand and built a real brand. If you're a player, building a brand adds options, it adds value to yourself, to your organization, etc. And I think there's a lot of people who have gotten very complacent and happy with the notion of like, well, look, I'm a professional player and why does it matter if I'm popular? I'm just going to get out there and perform the best I can. It matters. It matters to yeah. the bigger picture. It really does. And I think too, like a lot of orgs probably struggle because the turnover is so high, right? Like you're going to tell the story of someone and like, you know, two years down the road, like this guy might not be here. Like yeah. that has happened a lot in esports. And a large reason for that is like the lack of barriers to be an esports pro. You're like you'd be 14 years old and just really good at the goddamn game and you can get signed, you know, like, whereas at least in the NBA, I mean, there are exceptions that just skip college, right? Like Le LeBron. Well, there's, you know, a, there's, like there's a rule now, right? So there's there oh, been times where the rule existed and times where it didn't exist. And there's been a certain number of years and it's fluctuated as of right now. You have to, you, you have to be, I think it's 19 or whatever. You, basically you can't go straight from high school. If you're standard age, you have to do one year, whether gotcha. that's a year in the G league or abroad professionally or in college or whatever, uh, is up to you, but you have to do one year. Yeah. So like, that is like a barrier that I feel like kind of stops the turnover a little bit and allows pros to have a bit of a career. Um, but I feel like in esports, man, like the esports career just doesn't last very long considering the hours mm -hmm. put in. And then the, the second you start like really taking away like a large portion of the money they're making, mm -hmm. it's like, well, you're giving up those like high school, college years, you know, like where you, you know, the risk for doing this is insane. Like it's hard to get that time frame back. And there's a lot of opportunity in people's lives that they have to sacrifice to do this. Which is why I've always empathized with players. Obviously, I was a player, so it's easy to yeah. empathize with the players. But um, yeah, that's like a key issue I have on like the player side because I do think they're massively mm -hmm. overpaid right now. And you know, like forty grand a month for like some of these players that just like aren't doing anything on their socials is mm -hmm. like outrageous. I bet the orgs are to blame too. I guess kind of. I, they're primarily yeah. to blame. Now, <laughs> there's market forces that force their hand as i was talking about earlier but if you have to blame someone for rising play player salaries i don't know how you blame anyone other than the organizations right there's decisions yeah. that have been made by publishers that influenced it players have influenced it as well but you know and and i again i don't i, I say blame is in it, the, the kind of the buck stops with them but that doesn't mean blame in terms of like i think that they like really fucked up i think that there were a lot of reasons why this kind of rise was inevitable as was this fall so this is just part of the this life cycle of a uh, you know growing industry and part of the origin story of kind of the development of modern business around esports and that's okay. Um, but to your question of is it worth it? Well, every player is going to make their own different decision. Jake yeah. gets into this a lot actually in like game selection and thinking about the sacrifices and the trade offs. But you know in relation to a lot of other things, it's not that bad, right? Like my cousin is one of, is like literally one of the best female lacrosse players in the country and. She's playing professional lacrosse now. She she went to Northwestern. She had an amazing career there. She graduates. She's playing professional lacrosse. I have not asked her how much money she makes, but I have to imagine it's quite a bit less than than your average yes. esports player player in a tier one game in North America. So is it worth it? Well, it just depends. Who and are you? How are you wired? What do you want? What are your goals in life? That's that's going to be what decides whether or not it's worth it to invest the 10,000 hours to go chase a you know a career in a game where instead of making $400,000 a year, you might make $200,000 a year. It's not like these people are going to be poorly paid. Players are still going to be well compensated. It's just not going to be at the levels that we've seen for the last few years. Yeah, and that's where, to again, give right credit you know, like all of these collegiate esports programs, I have talked to so many people that are just getting free rides in college right now on these college teams. Which is awesome. But yeah, it's, it's insane. It's an amazing opportunity. And I highly, highly suggest people take that route at very least so that way you can get a degree while you're doing what you yeah. love. You know, like it's, it's literally just, it's a free opportunity that's been created out of thin air. You know, like I have my, my college that I graduated from contacting me, like acting like they did shit. Like when I was like, <laughs> you know, like they're trying to take credit for it. I'm like, bro, you guys were doing nothing back then. <laughs> I actually paid all of that shit. It took years. <laughs> um, so I think that is like a really positive thing. What do you think gets us out of here? Out of like this, this fucked up scenario, just time. It's it's time. It's better. It's under. So the purpose of the essay is there's some amount of forward looking and thinking about solutions. A lot of it is, 
diving deep into the how we got here because if you can't understand your if you don't understand your past you cannot fix it like you cannot solve the future without understanding the past and so we tried to drill really deep on different stakeholders different angles of challenges that the that the industry faces right and then look at opportunities that the industry has and so how do we get out of here we get out of here one step at a time with everyone making slightly better decisions than, than some of the decisions I've made previously. Some amount of it is a necessary correction, no matter how well, how smart, how sophisticated, even if everyone knew all this information for the last five years, we we're still gonna wind up here because we still, you know, franchises got sold at certain amounts, amounts of money were raised by a certain number of teams that were, as you said earlier, too many to support what actually makes sense overall, big picture from revenue generation. So some amount of this was just inevitable. We were, we've been on this collision course for five plus years, literally. Uh, and so we're gonna get out by some of these businesses folding, some of these businesses dramatically shrinking, the market adjusting as a result, people not having the same pressure to spend crazy amounts of money on certain things, right? And then we're gonna also get better at revenue generation. We need to understand that the, the jury was out for a while, but now it's back a little bit as it relates to some of our paths of monetization. Certain things are working really well. We do very well in selling sponsorships, for example, right? But we do very poorly in some other areas. Some of those areas are ways, places where we actually can and should improve in terms of approach and monetizing the better. Lots of them are actually, at this point, largely failed experiments, and then it's okay what else can we do? And the what else can we do, that is something we could do a whole nother 30,000 words on of like all the different things that have yet to be tried or have been tried in limited capacities, but not actually got there, right? So like one thing that I get into in the fandom essay is geographic connectivity, for example. It's a huge part of traditional sports. It's really clear that sports have much stronger social and emotional ties than what exists in esports writ large. And we can find ways to replicate that. The fact that the Overwatch League did not prove it to be success does not mean that it's a failure, right? Like the, the old mm. Thomas Edison quote of, you know, he didn't fail. He, he, he just found a thousand ways how not to make a light bulb, right? So we got to keep at this. We got to keep experimenting and we have to be honest with ourselves about what's actually not working and what could still work with tweaks or more time or experimentation, et cetera. Maybe geography is something that we put on the back burner for a little bit and we try again because to your point earlier, these parts aren't going anywhere. The, the, the no. cultural relevance of gaming is just going up and to the right, and some, while it's a small subset, while the games themselves are the golden goose, this is going to become an increasingly valuable egg, right? And as time goes on, I firmly believe when we get to 2050, when we list the biggest sports in the world, we're going to say soccer, and we're going to say a video game. That video game probably doesn't exist yet, but it's going to be a video game because if you look at all the other sports out there, none of them have the remotest chance of global ubiquity in the way that soccer has yes. and in the way that games very much can have. And so maybe we just need to get to a point where the audience is big enough that then you can say, hey, look, there's a large, large enough audience in Seattle and L.A. and New York and Austin and so on and so forth where you can actually sell out regular season games. You can actually get butts and seats because you need a critical mass in order for that to make sense. So maybe it's just a not yet thing, right? And, and that's part of what this essay series is all about. What is, what is a no? What is a maybe? What is a not yet? And what is a yes? And let's keep expanding on it. And it's going to be a lot of different levers that we have to pull and push on in order to actually get this to a better sustainable place. Yeah, I, lo I love that. I, I totally agree. I, I'm super optimistic about esports. I know this has been like a kind of doom and gloom type conversation where we talk about like all the problems that are going on in the industry. But the way I think about it is kind of like... <laughs> Just like the earth extinction events like there's been like a handful of like really big ones right and that's kind of like what esports has gone through in like 2008 ish or whatever like around mm -hmm. like the cgs time frame yep. that was brutal that was yep. brutal what happened like all of the money just left the scene like overnight when i was here it was crazy there's just nothing and it, we're kind of going through that again kind of looking forward because i'm optimistic i'm with you do you think that there's ever going to be regulations that come down on these developers and teams that then cause the next extinction event, like case openings in Counter-Strike. As a lawyer, do you think that that should be allowed for children? And like, is that something that worries you? Like when that happens? Oh man, we're taking a hard left turn. Uh, yeah, you know, that's like the two, last question I got for we you. We could do we could do two hours on just game monetization because it's so interesting. Okay, so I I don't have a problem 
with certain versions of this from a game monetization perspective and i do have a problem with other versions of this it was a logical evolution why why did this happen people under there's a reason why gambling games are designed the way they are i'm talking like true gambling like go to vegas and you're playing you know slot machines or roulette or whatever right and it's all specifically designed around like the the psychology the physiology of what's happening in your body the dopamine hit that you get from participating in it right and finding out the results and so it was a logical evolution to bring that dopamine hit to game monetization and to say why well, just have them buy a thing when you can have them buy a thing with endless potential it yeah. might be x or it might be x you know it might be y or it might be a the super rare thing that's worth mm. hundreds of dollars and that all your friends are gonna be jealous that you have oh did we mention money. that one dollar is like 345 fake coins and yeah like, totally. it, it actually cost you 700 fake coins yeah, the existence of the fake coin thing as well, like creating a layer separation. It feels like funny money, right? It's yeah. part of why the casinos give you chips, right? Yes. Um, so yeah, they are they're replicating it in more ways than one. I don't think that there's I don't have an issue with certain aspects of that version of game monetization. I think that there should be regulations around it as it relates to like fair market value and understanding that like you have to be transparent about odds and you know probabilities as it relates to what you're going to be able to get and there's some amount of like regulating it so that it's not like a just a terrible deal but it's not dissimilar that like does anyone have a problem with the fact that pokemon cards come in packs yeah right like i've heard this argument too yeah is that really that different so what we're going to just say like no more packs in pokemon cards you can only do this so i don't i don't really agree with the notion that that we have to protect our children from any form of monetization that is randomized in yeah. some way. But there are obviously like predatory ways of going about doing it, and there are tons of examples out there that are problematic. And I do think that part of the point of the law is to get in there and regulate this type of stuff. I don't think that this will in any way be catastrophic to like esports or games as a whole. What will happen is the predatory behaviors will be eradicates a little bit of time it takes the law forever to catch up to anything right yeah. and, and so eventually we will catch up and figure this out and, and hopefully it will do a better job of protecting people but i don't think that we need to like eradicate this taking a couple steps up the same staircase here we both have kids what do you think about like playtime limitation being like coming down upon from like the government what if it's like i mean look at like china for example mm -hmm. like you know like do you ever foresee in, in law something like that happen in the united states very unlikely to happen in the United States. It's a philosophical question about what you view as the role of government. Personally, I don't want my government telling no. me or my kids the amount that they can do or not do a thing. Same. Um, that's just not, that's my job. That is my job. And if you think that my, I, you know, you and I are both, we've spent a lot of hours gaming over the course of our lives. I, I hope, I genuinely hope that my kids do too. It's something I'd love to share with them. Uh, but it will not be uncapped. It will not be unrestricted. It will not be unwatched. I will be paying attention to all of it. And I will be thoughtful about what gets introduced when and how to do it um, and make sure that like all the structures within the in, within the family create balanced human beings and not someone that's going to spend 15 hours a day playing games. Yeah. God damn it, man. I feel like I could keep talking to you forever. I have totally like, so many could. questions in my head. Like I want to know like thoughts on like the analytics that the devs have being behind closed doors yeah that's I mean, my really last, okay that's my true last question okay i mean the really fast answer is that i think that those analytics exist on some level how clear they are about attribution i'm not sure they have every incentive in, in the world to hide them there's no upside for a publisher in in re revealing this information and they have every reason to believe that if this information is revealed to even one team that it will then become public record because Esports leaks like a friggin' sieve. So, um, yeah, I understand why they're not sharing it. And it, the imbalance of information gives them quite a bit more leverage. And I think that that's unfortunate. I wish there was a way for third parties, teams, players, et cetera, to obtain that information independently or through the publisher. Because it's that imbalance of information creates an unfair bargaining dynamic where they hold the cards. And so they can make statements that are really hard to challenge. Right. But whenever I will say that whenever 
and obviously slightly different people view this, but like whenever a company like Riot Games is like, we lose money on esports, I just roll my eyes <laughs> yeah. because this is not a charity. You are a business. You are in the business of making money, and reg- like, yeah, you can always move numbers around to show that you like lose money on a certain thing, but there's just no way that Riot is investing how much it invests in esports for altruism. There's a lot of explanations <laughs> for it, right? Some of it's direct revenue generation, some of it is brand building, player retention, whatever you want to call it. At the end of the day, what they are doing is they are making a decision that the amount of money they are expending is worth it for the value that they are generating for their business. It's not a charity. Yeah. So I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for that argument at the publisher level. And I, and I don't know how anyone really believes that argument or, or makes that argument with a straight face. I, I get that like it's some element of it's like towing the company line. It's the argument you got to make. And if you're in that situation, fine, you make the argument you can. But like, let's all be on the same page about what's actually happening here, regardless of whether or not they can directly attribute it, regardless of whether or not they can definitively prove on their bottom line, that it was worth it, the amount of money they spent, they generated more, they have made a decision that it is worth it to their business to invest at the level they have. Yeah, yeah, it's that's the line that's thrown around a lot, I'll say that, like the esports is not profitable for us line. And it sucks because the analytics are so fucking hard to come by in esports. Yeah. It, recently, I've, I've seen some like uh, AI companies come about that, you know, can track like logo placement because that was another big problem with the esports is like what the fuck is the hyperx logo on the jersey worth yep what is that worth is that worth 50 grand 100 grand who says how many people see that like Mm -hmm. how many how do we know how much exposure time you're gonna get like there's so many difficulties in understanding what what is being shown to the viewer right like you don't even know if your team's gonna make playoffs in some esports you don't even know if your team's gonna make the broadcast like there's multiple games going on at once like what the fuck is that like that's crazy so there's a lot of murky waters when it comes to analytics and i think it starts at the top i don't i don't know how we get out of that but i was that's a pretty good answer i like that answer i love it and it's fascinating you we keep going i mean i like i i love uh, talking to you maybe we do this again sometime soon because uh yeah there's the reality of the space is and this if you learn nothing else from the essays is why i didn't want to give you like a summary earlier it's complicated super and complicated. you have to understand all of how all of this interacts to have a, a, a strong pov i think my big beef with the entire conversation around the esports winter and a lot of what compelled us to write the essays was it wasn't necessarily that everyone had bad takes it's that everyone had really simple takes and this is not a this is not a set of issues that is well suited to simple takes yeah right this is not something where you can summarize it in 140 characters 280 characters or even you know 2800 characters you need a lot of background understanding of all of the inner workings of esports sports media you know monetization fandom you need all of this information in your head to develop a clear pov and then you have to figure out what you what you're trying to optimize for who are you and what do you want and then you can start to scratch the surface of answers yeah that's i think that's a good closing thought and if you guys have any other like thoughts or any other interest in this i really really highly suggest you read this article from bryce ovi and jake it is amazing and they outline a lot of probably the questions you have you know like why can't we just get challenger skins for every team well it's not the <laughs> trust me just read the article okay like yeah. I, we don't want to talk about all this shit right now all right just read the article and listen to what this man says he's been here for a minute he's talked to all the key stakeholders so any closing thoughts bryce just thanks for having me. This was a super fun conversation. I really appreciate the platform. I'm glad you're doing this. I hope people find it interesting. Um, and let's do it again sometime. I'm sure we put a lot of people to sleep. I'm <laughs> sure we did too. If we made it to the end of this, I'm really impressed. It's kind of like the essays. It's self-selection. A lot of people are going to opt out of it. The people who opt into it, I hope that they learned something or they enjoyed it. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Bryce. <laughs>